<laughs> Welcome to the Weird Realities Network, where we embrace the weird and celebrate the extraordinary within us all. Join us on a journey into the depths of the unknown, where the strange and unusual take center stage. At the Weird Realities Network, we believe that everyone has a touch of weirdness, and it's this uniqueness that makes life truly fascinating. Our mission is simple yet profound, to create a space where the unconventional is not just accepted but celebrated. Through our podcasts, we delve into the realms of the paranormal, history, science, conspiracies, and folklore. But we're more than just a podcast. We're a community of like-minded explorers, passionate about unraveling the mysteries that surround us. So, join us. Follow us on social media, subscribe to our podcast, and become a part of the Weird Realities Network. Together, let's embark on a journey beyond the ordinary, where every twist and turn reveals a new facet of the weird. Welcome to a community that celebrates the extraordinary in us all. Welcome to the Weird Realities Network. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> we are waiting for our special guest to join us. He's having some technical difficulties. So, um, it is just the kids and I. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for arranging this. And we have scientific skeptic Richard <coughs> joining us and the one, the only Cecil. <laughs> oh. Rich, Rich kind of looked like he was from Anonymous when we first came on. because I all know. Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> I expect him. Uh, I'm in my sinking chair. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mike Lewis. Hey, happy to have you on and happy to have everybody here tonight. I'm really excited to hear Mr. Baker's stories and just to sit back and take part in this virtual campfire. Absolutely. I got to get the internet sorted out. There yeah. Yeah, he, was, he was having he, some technical difficulties. He yeah. is in, um, <laughs> a, I think, a Wi Fi <laughs> light area. Yeah. So that's a big thing here too. Like I've I've been invited to a lot of conferences and stuff about making internet free for everyone throughout the state because uh, there's there are still pockets of Mississippi that no one has access. Okay. Yeah. It's a uh, here 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 in Arkansas. It's a uh, you have pretty good internet service or cell phone service as long as you're not too far off one of the major highways. That's where all the towers are. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you, if you get in a, if you get in a real high high ground, uh, you can you can see several from <laughs> from that spot, one spot. It, it trips me out how many towers there actually are because I live like on top of a ridge line, and when I look across, you look and even with the tops of the mountains, and you can just see towers everywhere. Yeah, and it's like hmm. oh yeah, that that's how it is here. New ones are being built all the time. So. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, it's very weird. Uh, I believe it messes with my luge. <laughs> no 5G, I don't think. I don't think we got 5G access down here yet. I'm gonna have to like pull y'all up on the TV so I can see what's going on behind Rich. He's got all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah those are the shelves I was talking to you about. I nice. see a Corvette back there. <laughs> it, it's a fake it's not a Corvette it's some kind of race car oh looks like a Corvette from where you're sitting it looks like a Corvette when I'm looking at it here too it's just it's all yeah. it's all a, right well my I see that we have Mr. Baker in the background so I'm going to go ahead oh, bring him in hi hey, Kimbo there he is. howdy 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 hey Kimbo <laughs> We are live with Kumbo Baker, and this is a dream come true for me. I've been listening to Mr. Baker since 2017, and he is my go-to for Bigfoot research information. Yep, yep. That I was appreciate it. that. Yeah, and for for me, it was around 2017 when I discovered the uh, discovered the outlaws. Then, and uh, it didn't take long to figure out that uh, that you you knew, you knew something about what you were talking about. So. I came into somebody. Who, I came into somebody who I didn't think I had ever listened to you until I started listening to you today. I was like, "Oh wait, I've heard this guy a thousand times." <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Baker, I'm a Mississippi girl, and my grandma is from. Well, yeah? my, mama, my mama was from um, Alabama, and uh -huh. listening to you made me realize that that old black boy she was talking about was a booger. <laughs> Yeah, and, and a lot yeah. of stuff started making a lot more sense then. Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, where in Mississippi are you from? Well, I live in the Jackson area, but my mama lived over by Waynesboro. Waynesboro, Alabama. I'm not sure where that is. Oh, it's Waynesboro, where? Mississippi. Is where my oh. mom and them grew up. But um, okay. I don't know. She was over in South Louisiana. Um, excuse me, South Mississippi in Alabama. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. I think I know where Waynesboro is down here near Columbia and some of those places like that and Wiggins and mm -hmm. some of those good places way down there. Way down there. It's um around, on the Alabama the DeSoto, side of Hattiesburg. Around the DeSoto. Right. Yep. 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 Yeah, I've uh deer hunted down there a little bit. Nice. Uh, haven't really in that exact area I haven't really chased after any, any boogers or anything, but uh <laughs> but they're certainly in there. Mm -hmm. I'm no doubt about have. it. Yeah. So if oh so yeah, Miss, for, Mississippi's lead up with them. So for people that don't that may not have heard of you before, can you give them a little insight of who you are, good sir? Okay, um, I grew up outside of Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and uh, went to school in Sheffield, which is a uh, actually Muscle Shoals back then was a, a suburb of Sheffield. But uh, anyway, I I grew up out. Uh, out you know east of Muscle Shoals there in, in Colbert County, Alabama, and uh, grew up on a farm. And when I was really young, uh, I'm talking about two and a half, three years old, I started finding out about Bigfoot areas. My grandmother called them the the neighbors, and as my dad and my grandfather called them, uh, uh, he they called them catamounts. But you got to realize this is in the in the mid fifties, um, and the word Bigfoot hadn't been invented yet, and the word Sasquatch heard in this part of the country. Uh, but I can remember, you know, way back yonder, uh, you know, before I was even three years old, hearing the things at night, yelling and carrying on, and uh, you know, I ask, you know, I asked my dad, ask my grandfather grandfather you know what's that what's that and they oh it's just that old catamount don't worry about it angle by you and uh um i'm living out there I've, i'm retired now and I'm, I'm living out there on the on the farm again but uh i saw my first one right outside my bedroom window when i was four years old and uh back then we didn't have air conditioning and we slept at night with our windows open and my dad, the house we lived in, uh, my dad had put uh, gravel all around the outside of the house, about a four foot wide strip. So that when it rained, we didn't have gutters on the house. When the rain would run off the roof, it would hit that gravel and dissipate rather than cutting into the dirt and splattering old red clay mud all over up on the side of the house. And, uh, so I was laying there in bed at night and I heard somebody outside the window walking on that gravel, crunching that gravel. And uh, we had those old uh, crank out casement windows that were up high in the wall. And um, and you'd, you'd crank them open at night and the screen was on the inside. And that, that is a, something that well, you'll figure out in a minute why I'm telling you that. But uh, we had a, there was a, had a big attic and that sucked air into the house and then blew it out up through the roof. And um, and so they'd turn that thing on at night, so it'd, it'd pull the, the cool night air in uh, across, across you. And uh, uh, I was sleeping up on the top bunk, which was closest to the window. I heard somebody walking out there, and I thought it was one of my friends. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like 1 o'clock in the morning. You know, and of course, I didn't look at the clock or anything like that. Thing. I probably couldn't even read a clock back then. Certainly didn't even have one in my bedroom at four years old. <laughs> and uh, But I got up and I unclipped the screen and I lifted it up and I leaned out and I looked down and there wasn't anybody there. I looked to the right, wasn't anybody there. I looked to the left. And there's this thing back there and he's got his back up against the wall. And I remember his palms of his hands were flat against the bricks and he had his head turned he was looking at me and I looked at it 
and it looked at me, and I don't know how long we looked at each other, and all of a sudden it goes like <laughs> that. It, it bared its teeth at me. Didn't growl or anything. It just bared its teeth. And to this day, I don't know if he was attempting to smile at me or if he was threatening me. I truly don't know. And it, it scared the crap out of me, though. And I jerked back inside and went flying off the bunk and went running into Mama Daddy's room. You know, Mama Daddy, Mama Daddy, there's a yellow-eyed blue headed monster out there. And the deal, Reese, I called it that. The moon was up and the moon was shining into his eyes sort of from an angle. So his eyes were glowing yellow. And and I, the thing that the, the boogers out here, or the Bigfoot out here on our farm, we're right here by the Tennessee River. And they all look like they're all clean. They don't look like the ones I used to see down in Mississippi a lot, but they're they're really clean looking. They look like they've just come from the beauty shop. <laughs> and, and this one had sort of auburn colored hair and um, and with a moon shining on it, it looked real shiny, and, and it but it looked like it was bloody. I mean, it, it looked real reddish, and and I thought it had you know, blood in its hair, and that's why I, I ran into my parents' from my room yelling, you know, that there was a yellow-eyed, bloody-headed monster outside my window. <laughs> now, important thing, if my parents weren't totally aware of these things, they would have said, oh, son, you didn't see anything like that. Just go on back to bed. It'll be all right. No. When I said that, my dad instantly jumped out of the bed. And his, I remember his slippers were right side of the bed. He, like, jumped out of bed. And his feet went right in those slippers, you know, like a fireman jumping into his boots, you know. And and he grabbed his big old chrome Everetti uh, flashlight off the bedside table. And he grabbed his shotgun out from behind the door. And he goes running out and he yells at my mom. He says, he says, Doc, get the kids and y'all lock yourselves in the bathroom. Wow. She said, okay. There was no, qu he didn't say, they didn't say anything to me. He, they just said, when I said it, my dad sprung into action instantly. So mama got me and my sister, my little sister was still sleeping in a crib, if I remember right. And they grabbed her and, uh, and, Mama herded us in the bathroom. She made us sit down in the corner and mom closed the door and locked it. And she sat down on the floor and backed up against us. And she had her 38 with her and she rested it right over the, uh, right across her knees. Wow. And we sit and we sat there like that for probably 10 minutes or so. And in a minute we heard down to the far end of the house, Dot, it's me. Don't shoot. It's me. Don't shoot. Dot. You know, she says, okay, come on up here. And, and, uh, and so he come and he says, Doc, honey, now it's me, don't you? And, uh, and she says, she says, you open that door just a little bit and stick that shotgun barrel through that door so I can see. And so the door cracked open just a little bit and and uh, and uh, she had gone up and unlocked the door. And anyway, that door cracked open just and she's it's about six inches of that shotgun barrel came through the door. And she says, okay. <laughs> and they had opened the door and she's, he said, now don't shoot now. <laughs> and, and mama says, next words, I, she, did you see it? He wow. says, no, but I heard it beating feet, you know, uh, and, and, and told her where it was going to the, you know, toward the Northeast and, and to, to a hedgerow that is to this day, still a travel for him. Wow. And um, so uh, as a matter of fact, this hedgerow where, where it took off running to, is about 75 feet from where I'm sitting right now. Like said, to this day, that's still a travel route. And I've got I've got some good pictures of two of them traveling together by uh, quadrupedally that I took just here a few weeks ago when we had snow on the ground. Wow. And I, I've got pictures of the tracks now. Um, but uh, I had taken the dogs out late at night to, you know, before we went to bed to want to do their business and they were all looking real wary over there and and i put two of them up and i kept a little female on the leash a little female german shepherd and we eased over there and she was looking around <laughs> <laughs> looking around the, the trees you know and you know we found those those two trackways but anyway so i grew up with them and when we would plant when we would plant a garden then 
we would go over back on the back of the farm and plant a bunch of stuff for, and I, I remember asking my grandmother, why are we planting stuff back here? And she says, there's for the neighbors. And I said, there's nobody lives back here. And she said, Oh yes, they do. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, man, and then my great grandma, my granny Baker's mother was, uh, you know who you listen to somewhere between a quarter and full Cherokee and a, you know, maybe a quarter Cherokee. I don't I'm not sure. And, uh, but she used to talk about them and, and, uh, and my grandmother and my great grandmother, they talked about them like they were just perfectly as normal as rabbits and, and squirrels and stuff. Uh, you know, there was no question about their existence. They were just something that we lived with. And, uh, uh, and my dad always, you know, we had a, a little orchard here, had a few, you know, so a few apple trees, a few pear trees and a few, uh, peach trees but over on the back of the farm in the fence rows my dad always made sure that there were that there were uh plum trees growing and the reason he chose the plum trees is so that because they wouldn't get big and they wouldn't spread out and overshadow part of the field they would you know pretty much stay confined right there in the fence row and he also planted uh there were some persimmon trees back there and he would plant uh muscadine vines and scuppernong vines back there too because my dad loved to make wine and we had some of those up around the house. And I learned years later that he wanted, you know, gave them their own so that he would, they would leave his alone. And, and when we planted all that stuff back on the back of the farm, so they wouldn't bother our stuff. But anyway, so I grew up around them. I learned real, real quickly that uh, we ended up being uh, carried into town to go to school. And there was, you know, another, some other guys that lived about a mile west of here that also went to school in town. And one of them made a mistake of talking about the, the he called them Yetis because back then the, the first thing we ever saw on TV about them was the old National Geographic special. And they were talking about the abominable snowman or, or, or Yetis. And he, uh, he got, he talked at school about some Yetis that came and, and uh, raided their garbage cans, and they, they their dad sick their two German shepherds on this what they thought was a bear, and it turned out it was a yeti, and it killed their two shepherds. They came to school talking about it. Well, they teased him mercilessly because all those city city kids they didn't know what he's you know, they had no idea anything about about boogers or big. Hey, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> she thinks I ought to be playing with her <laughs> anyway, anyway so i learned by his example to not talk about them to, uh, unless it was people that lived out here and around and was used to them and um anyway i went to auburn and, and got out working and i ended up working for the government uh and i ended up working for uh, a big laboratory that that did all kind of testing for the government, everything from uh, nuclear power plants and nuclear propulsion systems to a lot of stuff for NASA and for the Army Missile Command. And um, after the Three Mile Island incident, which uh, you younger kids probably don't know what I'm talking about, but it was where they had an accidental release of radiation due to a valve malfunction up in Pennsylvania. And that caused a bunch of fear of nuclear power plants around the country and and there was a bunch of construction plants that were under construction were shut down and so the the nuclear side of our work uh sort of dried up and um so i ended up working full time for nasa and nasa sent me back to school and uh i ended up getting you know a bunch of they wouldn't let you get an actual degree. You know, you couldn't go across the state, but you took the same classes. And when you completed, you know, graduated, you got an engineering certification. And I got several of those. And But uh, I had an opportunity to, to get into the group that worked in Mission Control Center. And so I, I went to school for all that and passed it. And um, I worked on uh, in Mission Control on seven shuttle missions. And I was in there when the Challenger blew up and four of the astronauts that, that died there were friends of mine. We were good enough friends and we would eat lunch together and stuff like that. 
And uh, a lot of people don't realize it, that when most of the astronauts only fly, you know, one or two times in their life, the rest of the time they work as an engineer with the you know, rest of the guys. So, you know, they're, they're you know, I, I worked in a build in buildings that had uh, astronauts and stuff that worked in them that, like I said, uh, you know, you, they worked as just regular engineers, you know, unless they were flying or something in which that didn't happen very often. But uh, anyway, so I got to know a lot of them. And uh, Then after the Challenger accident, there wasn't a whole lot going on on the NASA side of the house for a while. And we built up a bunch of uh, uh, a Hugh Mongus experiment package that later flew on the shuttle. That was part of the uh, strategic defense initiative or um, what we called Star Wars. Then after that, we were just sitting around and I got bored. So I started working on working over on the uh, Army Missile Command side of the house. So I worked on a bunch of uh, missile projects and stuff. And all this time I held a, uh, you know, a secret in above. I, for years and years, I held a top secret plus a nuclear, nuclear Q clearance, which is another type of top secret. But I got to travel around a lot and I was amazed. I was down at Eglin Air Force Base on a project, and I got to know uh, some of the security people. We were on a our test site had had 24 hour security on it, and uh, we were out there one night producing a bunch of data, and I heard I heard a Bigfoot holler out the swamp. I knew exactly what it was because I grew up hearing them. So. Uh, this uh, E5 was sitting there, and he says, uh, did you hear that? And I said, yeah. And uh, he says, he said, you know what it is? I said, yeah. He said, that's a Bigfoot, isn't it? Well, I was pretty shocked. And uh, I said, well, as a matter of fact, it was. And we got to talking, and he knew quite a bit about them. And he got to telling me about them and places he'd been and that, or he'd heard about them and so I, f I figured out I said dad gum you know there's Bigfoot on some of these government installations so I started I started traveling around the country uh, you know with my job you know places like White Sands Missile Range and uh, Edwards Air Force Base and and uh, you know, other places I started looking for science Bigfoot and this guy that I had gotten an open said, he clued me in on the, the people that I who I need to be asking, you know, who not to ask and who was safe to ask. Oh. And I was astounded. And I, I, can't, I ain't sharing that. So don't ask me. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I was utterly astounded. Uh, uh, the, the Bigfoot. Uh, information that I found on government property and um, everything from national forests to military bases and uh, you name it. And so I figured Uncle Sam owned me from nine to five or eight to five or whatever and, and overtime sometimes. But, you know, if I wasn't directly working on some project, then the rest of the time was mine. So I beat the bushes a lot you know, all around the country. And uh, over the years, I've I've actually researched Bigfoot in 40, 43 out of 50 states. Wow. And the only states that I have, uh, I've been in most, I've been in some of these other states, but I didn't have time to research Bigfoot in them. But uh, the ones I haven't researched in is Alaska, Hawaii, Oregon, Montana, Michigan, Connecticut, and, and believe it or not, North, uh, South Carolina. Those oh. are the seven states I've not researched in. And believe it or not, I, I was one of the first ones to discover uh, what we what I call ur urban Bigfoot. And uh, I found on a on a government project, we were at a contractor's facility uh, down in South Alabama, and we were staying in Troy, Alabama, and. I started hearing reports, you know, people talking like, you know, I'd be in a, I used to eat breakfast and, and supper in some, uh, in a place where some construction crews hung out. 
and I started overhearing stories of of uh, Bigfoot sightings out where they were building a golf course out on the west side of town. And then I heard some stories about they were they were just opening up a bypass around the, the uh, west and the, and the south side of town. And they were, you know, were building some new restaurants and stuff out there like Wendy's and things. I started hearing stories about uh, Bigfoot raiding the dumpsters behind a, a Wendy's there. And uh, I think it was a Wendy's or a Burger King. And I had already knew before I went down there that that there were a fair amount of sightings out north of town uh, where there used to be a, a, a fire tower, uh, you know, one of those old uh, towers that the rank, forest rangers would get up in and watch for forest fires. And it was a hangout for kids. And, uh, and I couldn't believe that these Bigfoot were coming up into town, inside the city limits, you know, and they were following creeks and, and drainage ditches and stuff. And so I started investigating, you know, more in town. And I found, believe it or not, I have found Bigfoot on Staten Island, New York. Wow. In two different places on Staten Island. I went to Long Island, New York, chasing out some reports. I never found any evidence of them or anything. I saw, I, I talked to people who said they'd seen them. I have found them in multiple places in the city limits of Chicago and in Chicago suburbs uh, in, in a, what they call forest preserves there. And, uh, and it's amazing. Found coyotes, deer, just astounding the stuff that I found in those forest preserves. But I found, I have found them in, inside the city, city limits of, of sizable towns all over the United States. And I was astounded what I found, not just right outside of Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Houston, Texas. I mean, a lot of towns. So yeah. I sort of pioneered urban Bigfoot research. But anyway, so. That's kind of wild. You figured they would definitely stay away from cities for sure, but that's cool. Oh, yeah. They love these. They love the nature belt, and green belt, and, and stuff. And if you've got a town like Des Moines, Iowa, that has a pretty good sized river that flows through it, they're all over the place. Yeah. And uh, I've had some. <laughs> I've had some real fun messing with the boogers in Des Moines. <laughs> <laughs> I've scared some people half to death. <laughs> Have you ever been up northeast? Do what? Have you ever been up in the northeast? Oh yeah, I've oh, researched yeah. in. Uh, well, like I said, the only the only the only state in the northeast I haven't researched in is Connecticut. I believe it or not, I found creditable um, uh, Bigfoot evidence uh, in Rhode Island, even northern Rhode Island and Mass Western Massachusetts. Uh, now. I've chased a lot of reports in New Hampshire and uh, Vermont and never found a thing. Now, I don't doubt that the people were, were telling the truth, but but uh, I just I was just wasn't at, at the right place at the right time. And I did a lot of research in Maine and uh, chased out uh, chased out reports of, of them in a Bigfoot activity in uh, Baxter State Park. And um, uh, in another area there, and I, I found I found a little bit of sign around Baxter State Park, and I found a little bit of sign. I can't remember if it was Portland or Augusta, Maine, outside of one of, the, one of those towns. But I never I never had a sighting. Never even saw eye shine or anything. I never was able to call up any of them. But uh, but uh, upstate New York, uh, you know I've. I've researched in several areas in New York, and a little bit in Pennsylvania, um, but you know, believe it or not, Delaware and New Jersey, Maryland, well, Western Maryland's got some seriously boogery places in it. <laughs> but, uh, Virginia, no? yeah, and uh, uh, I, I was on out on the Delmarva Peninsula, which is the uh, eastern side of Chesapeake Bay, and it's shared by Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. I think that's right. 
And uh, I was astounded how uh, of the desolate areas that are down there. And uh, I found some pretty pretty clear sign. Never did never did hear any. Never did see any. But um, right over there on the uh, they call the eastern shore of Maryland, uh, out uh, near a big uh, marsh where there a lot of a lot of duck hunters, uh, you know, hang out in the winter time. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's always amazed me the places that I have, that I have found them, you know, and, um, and like I said, it's certainly, certainly, uh, I don't find them everywhere, everywhere I've looked, but I was astounded, absolutely blown away to find them, to find out that there was a, uh, not very many, but there was a few at Edwards Air Force Base out in California. And I mean, that place is a, desolate moonscape but there's a few in there found them in a uh, in arizona uh especially along the mogollon rim um that that was a surprise to find them in arizona i was out there we were uh, unisys space systems and um and uh, phoenix was building a bunch of, of uh, test equipment for us to use on the shuttle itself the shuttles themselves as well as the equipment as well as the experiments and myself and another engineer were out there to witness all the acceptance testing and they were having trouble. So we had a lot of extra time on our hand on our hands while they were uh, trying to get this thing up and running. Right. So, you know, we, we hit the desert, we, we took off and, and I was uh, really amazed at this, the stuff that we found out there I was not ex expecting it at all. But, uh, and then uh, I spent uh, quite a few months at White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico and heard reports of, of them out on the range. I never found sign or saw one, but we absolutely ran into them just, just off the range. And uh, we, uh, we, we had several places there in, in central New Mexico uh, just east of the missile range, we ran in. We we found Bigfoot in there, and uh, uh, we we heard uh, there was a state park out there that we heard it was a hippie hangout, <laughs> and we were going. We were wanting to go in there and research my myself and other engineer, you know, check the place out. We were warned that hey, watch out for the hippies there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, leftover hippies living there and old microbuses and school buses and crap. We went in there and found them. And I had topo maps of the area and we had decided where we were going to go look. There was this one old guy and but he looked like something right out of it. He reminded me of uh, who was the lead singer of the Grateful Dead, uh, Garcia. Yeah. He looked like him. Uh, what was his name? Uh, Jerry Garcia. He looked like Rich. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, could have been, he could have been Jerry Garcia's twin brother and he, he said y'all going up in there uh, yes sir we're gonna, we're gonna what are you going up there for well, we're just going to check it out you know and, and uh, he said oh, I better watch out yeah, there's things up there you don't want to mess with and <laughs> well what uh, I just, you know and he, it would come right out and say it <laughs> So off we go, and we weren't 200 yards up in this draw, and we started getting bombarded from rock with rocks from two dire different directions. Now, interesting thing I got to tell you about when they're throwing rocks at you, they're not throwing rocks at you personally. They're, they'll throw them near you to either just mess with you or to scare you. Um, we kept going up this canyon, and as the further we got up this canyon, the rocks kept getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> we found a little side canyon and I could tell that the rocks right there were sort of worn slick and smooth and something had been going up and down right there a bunch yeah. and I, and uh, my research partner buddy was he's a few years older than me and he'd had he'd been involved in a terribly bad uh, motorcycle wreck years before and his knees were messed up so he couldn't crawl up there but he boosted me up and I managed to get up in this little side canyon 
And as soon as I stood up, the rocks changed from cantaloupe size to watermelon size. Mm. And, and I came sailing off over and we're hitting about 20, 30 feet out in front of me and rattling, banging around. And uh, I decided I'd gone about as far as I needed to go. <laughs> and plus, I didn't hear it, but my buddy said he said he heard something growling right up on the lip of the canyon above me. But I didn't. I never did hear it. I was. I guess the rocks were banging, banging around me too much. But uh, anyway, uh, we came down out of there, and we had an incident. It's one of only two times that in all my years of research that I've ever known of somebody to get hit by a rock, by a rock that could hurt you. And uh, we were coming down. We were leaving that that canyon. And we were coming down the side of you know it, it was a it was a big canyon up into the side of a mountain. We were coming down it, and the rocks were about the size of uh, softballs to cantaloupes that were still coming from behind us in two from two different directions, coming over us and hitting out in front of us thirty or forty feet. And a a rock about a little bit bigger than a softball or so hit. It was a granite rock, and it hit a big granite boulder out in front of us. And ricocheted off that, hit another rock, and hit my buddy right in the side of his left shin. And it hit him hard enough that it knocked him down. It took his leg out from him and he fell down. Instantly, it got dead quiet and all the rock throwing stopped. And I think, honestly, the, the boogers up there like, oh, hell. <laughs> oh, <my> God, you <laughs> know. <laughs> yeah. Because that happened. One time down in a uh, down in Alabama, at a at a campground uh, in a in a state park or or a state recreation area, and um, Niffy, I'm gonna put you in the bedroom. He's probably this. She wants to be <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, we were sitting there under uh, under a pavilion, and the boogers were bouncing rocks off the roof. And somebody, they, one of them threw one in and it hit right on the edge of the roof and bounced off and hit a tree and hit one of the ladies right in the uh, right hip. And again, instantly, uh, all the rock throwing stopped. But now they will thump little like acorns and little pea gravel at you and stuff like that. They'll do that and thump, you know, hit, hit your body. Uh, but little bitty things like that, uh, you know, little tiny little sticks and things. But they won't purposely hit you with anything that could hurt you or put a bruise on you. you know? So at least uh, I've never. I, hey, there's Jimmy Osborne on there. Son of a gun. Y'all let anybody up here. And shit. <laughs> Jimmy is one of my good research buddies down here. And we worked together uh, for about a year and a half back in the day. And, and then we ran into each other again. You know, just several years ago, and we we hooked, hooked back up. We started chasing boogers together. So, and uh, Jimmy's been with me uh, all over uh, Alabama, Mississippi. Uh, I know he's been to Oklahoma with us. It's, uh, gosh, I can't even think of all the places. LBL, uh, you know, Land Between the Lake, Tennessee, Kentucky. Uh, uh, we've been over in Georgia. Uh, and we've we've covered some covered some country over the last few years. Uh, anyway, so that's that's sort of how I got started. And I I know that's the definitely wasn't the reader's digest version. I'm sorry I took up too much time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fascinated by it. Like it's really cool. Um, I live in southeastern Kentucky. You said you've explored around here or in Kentucky. Lord, yeah. Uh, Daniel Boone National Forest. I was rooting around all over Daniel Boone uh, out out uh, west of Corbin and was it Williamsburg in that area and over towards the Cumberland Falls live, State Park, all that yeah, area. I live, yeah, I live in um, Corbin's the next town over from me. Yeah. Oh, wow. What are you, you, yeah. You're around E Town? Yeah. Yep. You're around, around E Town? Yeah. That's exactly right. where yeah. I'm at. <laughs> I've, I've, I've run all those hills and hollows. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I worked up there when I was in 
and I, I put myself through school. So I, I worked all over the place and I worked around the coal mines and, and, uh, transloaders and stuff like that. And, uh, but, uh, we, uh, but I've, I've researched back in the mid 1970s. We're talking about 75 and 76. I was rooting around looking for buggers down in the, in the, in the Daniel Boone national forest. And what was funny is I, I noticed that, uh, I knew I was on the right track. We were down there. You ever fish below the falls, below Cumberland Falls? You ever been down there? Yeah. On yeah. State Park? You know the place they call Dog Slaughter? Yeah. 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 We were we were fishing down there <laughs> at 3.30 in the afternoon. And I was in there by myself, you know. I noticed these people start packing up, getting ready to leave. And I said, I said y'all going to move to a different place? But it, it, the catfish were running. It was in May. We were catching. And uh, I said, uh, yeah. Y'all limited out, or you, you, you know, gonna go a different place? He said, the guy told me, uh uh. He said, You don't want to be down here at dark. And he said, You don't even want to be down here at dusky dark. He said, <laughs> He said, You need to be gone in the next 30 minutes. And he said, Where are you going to? And I said, I said, Well, I'm staying over E uh, Town, is, that's where I was staying then. And he, he says, uh, He says, uh, You need to be packing up and getting out of here right now. He said, You got a long way to drive before you get. Civilization, <laughs> and uh, so uh, I actually packed up my follow followed them out because they were going sort of that way, and uh, so I got to asking the next, you know, the next uh, Monday some of the guys that I work with. I said, "What's the deal?" And they said, "You remember the old story about Daniel Boone killing a Yahoo?" And uh, I said, "Yeah, I remember that." He says, "Well, a Yahoo is another word, another word for a Bigfoot." And he, he said that. Right above the falls, <laughs> and uh, and I I did this digging. I found out that's exactly right. And he said, and he said, and all of his relatives are still in there, and they're still mad about it. <laughs> I'm like, all, all the Yahoo, Yahoo's relatives are still in there, still mad about it. So uh, oh. I actually talked, I actually talked a couple of them going back down there with me, and uh, uh, but we got once we got down there, they would they would would not stay. After dark. I never. Uh, so anything I did down there after dark, I did a sort of on my own. And uh, uh, I, was trying, I, I had an old '74 model. Actually, it wasn't old. It was a company truck and a '74 model F100, a three quarter ton. I loved it. it. Had the 300 cubic inch straight six in it with a four speed with a granny low. And uh, IDs. I had the old air conditioner that hung down below the dashboard. Absolutely freeze you to death. But uh, anyway, I'd, pull, I'd drive off down in there and I'd pull it, I'd crack that window down just not that far, you know, and I'd get up here, Whoa! you know, and I'd holler out that crack. <laughs> and uh, but uh, that place was creepy. I, I almost never got out of my truck after dark down there by myself. But uh, I got a lot of answers down in there in a, in a few places and uh, got craps thrown at me, everything from. Uh, sap oak saplings that were ripped up out of the ground, you know, that big around at the base and thrown out there in front of me, you know, leaves, roots, everything. Uh, uh, they they seem to be a little bit belligerent down in that area, but uh, it's the but they're in there. <laughs> Do I? It's the moonshine. <laughs> well, hey, I grew up. Hey, my mama and my mama and grandmother used to make moonshine, so. I'm very familiar with that culture and what to look for. And in areas, I occasionally would come across some of that, but, uh, but most of the time I didn't, uh, I never, I never, uh, a lot of that area, I didn't ever see any sign of moonshine at all. Not to say it didn't happen in the past, but when I was there in the seventies, I, I didn't see it. But, uh, like I said, at my <laughs> little side note about moonshine, my dad, uh, my grandmother, and my mother made moonshine in a in a uh, two can, a modified two can milk pasteurizer. And what a two <laughs> two cans made milk can is five gallons. So this thing would hold ten gallons of milk or ten gallons of mash. You know, well, not through really the mash, but they call it the wine after they've strained the, the grain and everything out of it. And they modified it. And it 
just worked perfect for a moonshine still. And uh, with, with a couple of real simple modifications, and the stuff that came out of it was just as pure and good as anything you'd buy in the liquor store. Everything was all stainless steel, and anything that was that wasn't stainless was silver soldered. And um, so there wasn't any any lead or galvanized stuff or anything. Like that. But uh, my dad had the patience of Job, and he would go up to Tennessee where the Amish are, and he would buy these little six gallon casks. And a cask is like a miniature barrel that's you know about eh, about just short of two feet tall and be about it'd be about you know maybe a foot in diameter or something like that and it holds six gallons of, of shine and they were charred on the hit by them that had already been charred on the inside and uh and he would pour that moonshine up in those bar those casks and he'd plug it and he'd write the date on it and he'd lay it on its side with a date reading horizontal off he would the date would start in the center and go out to the to the left i mean to the right and then every few months like every six months or something like that or maybe every three months he would turn it 90 degrees clockwise always and he'd write the date and and some months later he'd come back and turn it and our house you could go look under the sinks in the closets uh behind the furniture, the sofa, anywhere in our house that you could look and hide something that size out of sight. There were casks of moonshine whiskey aging. <laughs> he would he would never he would never open up one of those casks before it had aged six years. Wow. Of course the dates were on there when he started it. And uh and, and I, he had the patience of Job. And yeah. at my dad's my dad's funeral I was surprised a number of people that, that came and said, uh, said, man, the, the best whiskey I ever drank, your dad made it. I says, well, I hate to burst your bubble, but my dad didn't make it. <laughs> Mama and my grandma, <laughs> Granny Baker made it. You're Granny Baker? Because <laughs> she was well, well known in the community. I said, yeah, they made it. My, my dad, my dad aged it. And, uh, my granny was a, was a, she was a character. Uh, we used to laugh and say that they, they modeled Granny uh, Granny Clampett on Beverly Hillbillies after my Granny Baker. And, uh, she, she was very active in the Methodist Church back then. And the Methodist Church still had a group in there called the WTCU, the Women's Temperance Christian Union. And they were all sworn to not drink anything. Well, every time they was having some kind of a, uh, a little get together or something, Granny would make these things she called whiskey balls. And uh, and they were a little, they were, I don't know, they were sort of a little piece of candy about, you know, about as big as a small or medium sized meatball. And she'd make a couple of big plates of them. She'd take them out there and she'd put them down. And uh, <laughs> Mama and Granny and Bill were in the corner laughing. All those little, little temperance union ladies, Bill, were sucking those things up, eating them like, oh, these things are so good. And <laughs> they were full of whiskey. <laughs> and mom and granny be on the corner laughing <laughs> well, I won't go to hell for telling that <laughs> but, uh, but uh, she had an honor streak in her and she grew she made fig preserves that were um, that she would take to the county fair and stuff like that and she'd you know they were really really she was, they were, no, I couldn't stand the things but all the fig trees grew around the outhouse. You know, they still had an outhouse in the backyard. And uh, they had to get that good natural fertilizer. You know, those fig tree roots going right down that outhouse. Well, I was over at her house one day, and and uh, I was free slave labor, you know. And and uh, we had been planting flowers or doing something. And we were, we were taking a lunch break. And uh, she was up there washing dishes, and I was sitting there at the table doing something. And, probably reading the comics or something in the newspaper. But uh, anyway, all of a sudden she's, dang it, gum it. And she runs over there and grabs a broom out from behind the, the kitchen door, runs out the door, and she's running out there towards the outhouse. You get, she's swinging that broom overhead. You get out of here, you get. And I leaned up and I looked, what is going on? 
And about that time, his big old hairy arm reaches around the side of that outhouse and grabs a fig <laughs> off that fig bush. And she runs up and starts whomping the side of the outhouse with that broom and screaming and yelling, you get, get. This is broad daylight now. And all of a sudden, this, this big old booger comes running out from behind the, the outhouse. It runs and it steps right over the fence. Now, this fence has got is 36 inch hog wire with wow. three strands of bob wire on top of that. And it didn't even break stride. It just stepped right over it. So, and it didn't get nothing hung up on the way. And, uh, wow. and it took off down between the barns and stuff back there. And, and, uh, she was fussing at it the whole time. And, you know, that thing didn't, didn't bother her, but, but, you know, to her, they were just as normal as, as, you know, cats and dogs and rabbits in the world. But, yeah, but it was a trip growing up out here. We had uh, we had things happen. Uh, had a lot of stuff happen out here when I was growing up. Yeah, well, well Kumba, I know uh, where the uh, where the Indian mounds uh, was. It was that in Mississippi or Alabama where y'all used to go? And y'all That's actually down it. thermal. That was, it. that was in Mississippi. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was, and that's uh, yeah. Pat Rance got that. Uh, fantastic thermal uh, video down of, of them out coming across a, a field where there's a bunch of Indian mounds in it, and but they they cut it for haste every year. And uh, um, they uh, what was funny, what well, wasn't funny, what was really interesting is they uh, we sort of knew they were coming because the German Shepherd I had at the time, Bo, was looking real intently over there in, in the woods but we're talking about over 200 yards away but he was staring over in the woods and then so they started looking with the thermal and and picked them up and just just a little bit now, the woods were pretty thick so they had to get you know uh, as as they came up close to the tree line you could see them clearly and there were rolls of hay out there where they had cut the hay and rolled it, but they hadn't gathered them up. They hadn't gathered the rolls up. And there were three of them. And they started working their way across the field, going from roll to roll to roll. And there was one in the front, that the larger one, that would go first. And then the two smaller ones, which were probably juvies, would then come after it. And... Uh, it was pretty amazing to watch that, how fast they could go between those rolls. And if you hadn't been looking right at them, it'd be very, very, very easy to miss them. And uh, that's where I got hissed at my booger for the first time. And right out in front of us, there was like a little sinkhole out in the field. And, um, and there was you know, tr small trees and stuff like that grown up in, in, in and around it and a bunch of honeysuckle. And the larger one came up and there was a hay roll that was just on the other side of it. And it, once it got to there, I don't know if it, I, I missed it. I wasn't looking at the, I wasn't looking at the monitor or anything. Uh, Pat had it wired up. So what it was, what the thermal was seeing was, was showing up on a, on a pretty good sized monitor he had set up so we could follow it. And um, anyway, it dove down and sort of got under the honeysuckle. And at this point, my son was running the, uh, for Pat was, was running the thermal for Pat aiming it and everything. And he, and he was looking through the actual screen on the thermal and he followed it as it belly crawled through that honeysuckle and came up on the side towards us. Well, we decided to walk out there and see how close we could get to it, and which we did. There was about seven of us or so walked out there. We sort of spread out. And when we got up within about somewhere between 30 and 40 feet of it, it started hitting. And uh, poor old Bo was having a hemorrhage. I mean, he was, as, as my wife says, he, he was having a come apart. He did not like being out there and, uh, with that thing carrying on like that. And um, uh, we got to the point where it was hissing so loudly 
and plus sort of growling in between the hisses that we realized that, that we were at about the limit of what we could do without getting into trouble. But so we stopped and, and, and backed off. But, uh, but that, that was a pretty amazing night. Uh, had a little radio that happened when we got ready to leave that area. Uh, gentleman that had parked way down at the end of this road, he had gone past where we told him to park. And uh, he uh, parked too close to the tree line at the far end of the road that they came in. On. And uh, down there by himself. And we told him that and he was in a four wheel drive truck that was raised up on you know larger tires and stuff. And we warned him that the boogers will oftentimes crawl out and get underneath a vehicle if they got room. And he didn't believe us. And we told him, when you walk back to your vehicle, put your light and shine up underneath it. Make sure there's nothing underneath there. And and I told him, I said, and I'm not kidding. I'm dead serious. He thought we were, you know, pulling his leg. So when we got ready to leave, he and his wife go walking down there. And of course, he didn't he didn't shine a light or anything. His wife walks around to the passenger side and opens the door and. But she went to step up on the on the running board. There was one underneath and he reached out and grabbed her by the ankle. Wow, she's a believe. pretty good sized girl. She starts squalling and hollering and screaming and thrashing. And the poor old booger was hanging on for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> this is funny and it's not funny, but <laughs> yeah. I had a I in my hand I had a six million I had a six million candle power spotlight. And uh, I mean, this thing, it could have been a landing light for a 747. And uh, the thing weighed about 20 pounds. I mean, it'd wear you out to tow the ground. I clicked that thing on and I spun around and shined it down there. And what I see is her jumping up and down and thrashing and carrying on. And that truck was sitting there going, did you, did you, did you, did you, did you, did you. Oh, booger was was banging off the bottom of the truck. And so three or four of us went running down there and the, her husband didn't know what to do. He didn't know whether to wind his butt or scratch his watch. And uh, so we went running down there yelling and hollering and I, I was trying to keep that light on it. And finally it turned loose of her and shot out the back of the, the truck, you know, scrambled out and jumped up, took off down in the woods. That poor lady, mad, doesn't even come close to describing it. <laughs> and, uh, and I hate to say this, but they were divorced in less than a week. <laughs> All you had to do was shine the light. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, <laughs> it was. I'll tell you one thing, that lady put up a heck of a fight. I gotta give her credit for that. She was that was about a seven foot juvenile booger and uh probably weighed three hundred and something pounds, and she was snatching that thing around like it was nothing. <laughs> I mean her adrenaline was flowing. <laughs> right. And uh but uh that was a pretty exciting night. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so that's enough of that story. <laughs> well, I'm curious. Story. I'm, I'm hey, curious. Kumbo, it was good to meet you, but I got to take off. I got to pick up oh. a kid. All right. All right. I understand. I really appreciate well, you coming well, on. Well, if, if I hadn't have screwed up and forgotten a prior uh, a commitment, I would have been here on time. And, it's all good. And, yeah. yeah. I'm sure we'll do it again. Yeah. All righty. Rich is good seeing yeah. you, man. Good to see you guys, yeah. too. You take care. Good to meet you. Yeah. You Bye -bye. too. Good talking to you. Well, Kumo, yeah. I'm curious about, um, I've traveled up and down the Natchez Trace. That's, that's my stomping grounds. Like, I don't research, but I've been up there. And I'm curious if you have or, ever had any experiences around um, Riverbend. Riverbend. It's between um, Canton and French Camp, I think. Oh, I know a lot about French Camp. 
Dude, boogers are French camping. <laughs> Guarantee it. <laughs> well, tell me some Mississippi uh, booger stories. There's a bunch of them. <laughs> 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 No, my no kidding. Uh, I've studied the population of of Bigfoot and, and tried to get a handle on the nationwide uh, using scientific methods. Methods I've tried to uh, estimate the uh, uh, the population of Bigfoot in the United States. And one of the things that I, I learned pretty quick in in this endeavor that I had to have some uh, some a reference area to judge all of the rest of the habitat in the country against. And this had to be an area that where I, where I had good access to it and I could keep track of the boogers, the, the, the different troops or family units that lived on this piece of, on, in this area. I found a 300 square mile area in Mississippi. My reference area is in Mississippi. Oh, wow. And it's an area of about 300 square miles. Now that sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's uh, you know, it could that could be 10 by 30 miles, or that could be you know 15 by 20. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's not that big of an area. But uh, my reference area is, you know, there in, in Mississippi. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say where. In that area. And this is after studying it for uh, quite a few years. I determined. Now I use the same methods of of counting and estimating used by the by the Department of Interior, by the Audubon Society, by the uh, 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 forest, you know, forestry department, and uh, different groups that that keep track of rare animals. I even bought. Uh, the software that they used in the uh, now the, what I'm the, the last I bought is some software that they that they were using it this package is now over 10 years old but it's called presence I don't know if they're still using that or not because um, with things going on I haven't been able to keep as close a track of it over the low, last like five years that I did prior to this time but for about 30 years, I kept very, very, very close tab uh, uh, with the boogers that lived in this 300 square mile area. And I eventually figured out that there were six family units that lived in this in this 300 square mile area. Now that is one of the highest densities that I have found anywhere. Oh, wow. And I studied that area exhaustively and I developed, uh, I don't have time to go into it here, but I developed seven characteristics that I look for and I judge. And I made myself a checklist, a one to 10 kind of a deal. And as I traveled around the country and looked at other habitat, I went over this, this checklist and I compared the habitat in that area against the reference standard in Mississippi and a lot of people a lot of people think I'm crazy about this but I, I used a lot of engineering conservatism when I when I ran these numbers and stuff and I went back time and time again as many times as I could to a lot of these areas and uh Basically, what I figured out, boil it all down, the last time I updated everything, I, my conservative estimate estimate that here in the U.S. that we've got at least sixty four thousand Bigfoot in the in the United States, but I believe, I mean, in in my heart, I believe it's more like a hundred thousand. Wow. Uh. But uh, there are there are quite a few areas up and down the trace that 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 have concentrations of them. Uh, then there are some, uh, but the trace you've got to look at why the trace is there. It was originally a network of game paths that 
the animals animals were coming into that area up and down the trace, the whole length of the trace, because number one, water is abundant. Number two, there are a lot of mineral deposits in there. There are there are salt natural salt licks up and down the area where the trace is now. There are sulfur springs. And you wonder why would they be interested in sulfur springs? Because that is an area where animals can go to soothe wounds and to get away from get away from a lot of biting, a lot of pests, ticks and mosquitoes and stuff like that. And and the sulfur water is actually sort of a a tonic, you know, it can it it, it helps them, you know, get rid of internal issues. Um, and animals, a tremendous. You'd be amazed how many animals know about this stuff, you know, and and, and naturally come to it. And they will actually. Uh, I could take you to a, a particular uh, mineral lick, and it looks like just a dirt bank. But you get up there, just a bare dirt bank, which when you get up there to it, thousands of tracks. Everything from deer to raccoons, possums, rabbits, cougars. Uh, I, 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 I used to go to this one place multiple times a year over a period of, of uh, about 14 years and, and keep track of the tracks that I saw around this mineral lick. And it was amazing. The crowd. Bear tracks where bear are not even supposed to be. Uh, cougar tracks when <laughs> the fish and game department swore up and down. Well, I ain't no cougars around here. Yeah, they are. You know, I got, yeah. In fact, I, I actually photographed two of them there uh, around that lick. Uh, a few Bigfoot tracks. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, you name it. If it walked or crawled on the face of the earth, it was in there, you know, if in North America, it was in there. Amazing the amount of birds that I would actually see in there pecking up, uh, you know, beaks full of that, of that dirt and flying off with it. Uh, amazing the amount of wasps and dirt daubers and bugs and stuff that I'd see in there. But uh, anyway, but that whole area up and down the trace has got a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, mineral lakes, uh, springs, uh, edge cover where where different. You've got you've got these big uh, swamps and creek bottoms and stuff, and that are right next to you know hardwood stands of hardwood. Anywhere you have edge cover, whether it's natural or it's or it's man-made. And when I'm talking about this, is when you one type of forest or something transitions into another type or into a cropland or into a natural meadow, or into a swamp. Anywhere you have edge cover like that, there is a, there is a, it's much more biodiverse in that area than, than the surrounding areas that are, that are just, just hardwood forest, or just pine, or just swamp. And that is a, that is a place where wildlife concentrates. And all up and down the trace, you've got just, gobs of of natural edge cover but and nowadays it's even more so because you've got all this crop land and and uh logging operations you know in uh, pulpwood operations and stuff that is creating you know man-made edge cover edge areas so uh now so the in the natives they hunted in these areas and I guess you, I don't know if you knew or not ever saw the signs, Hadley, but uh, right near, right near French, uh, French Lick or whatever the name of the place is, uh, French Camp. French Camp. Real, French, right near French Camp was one of the largest roosting areas for the passenger pigeons anywhere in the, in the United States. Wow. And uh, now, and of course, you know, the passenger pigeons are extinct now, but where you have one of these big, huge roost areas, when birds roost, what do they do? They poop. And so the, the ground underneath that with all that poop becomes exceedingly fertile. <laughs> and uh, so you got all kind of things grow there that don't grow away from the roost area. So just nature itself provides uh, 
an interesting thing there, but it's, but the, and this is just there. There's a sign or something right there on uh on the trace right there close to French Camp. Either I can't remember if it's north or south, but it talks about the uh, the the uh, passenger pigeon roost there. And you know, back in the day, the early early settlers in that area would come in there, and they would kill those passenger pigeons by the tens of thousands. Uh, you know, it's a good food source, but uh, but anyway, so what happened was that area is just a, a naturally high concentration of of uh, game and uh, and things even people need. So the the native scouts coming in there for salt and. And stuff, and they knew there there are a lot of big springs there, big blue what do we call blue hole springs. I'm talking about a spring that's that's six, eight, ten, maybe twenty feet across, and un underground water out of the water table is is boiling up through there, and uh, so it's good, clean, fresh water, safe to safe to drink, and and then you've got a you know they they come in there hunting and stuff. Well, it just so happened that. By chance, it happened to be laid out in a way that was convenient for the, uh, for the, uh, you know, for the native population to use as a travel route. So it got worn down into a, into a footpath. Then, if you remember anything from the American history, once the white man came over the Allegheny Mountains and came down to, to the area where uh, the Twin Rivers and I can't remember the names of the rivers, but uh, they come together at what is now Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh, and they form what's the, now called the Ohio River. Oh. Well, the city of New Orleans had been founded way before uh, way before Pittsburgh, and New Orleans is down there in a bayou, and they were always strapped, needing good lumber. So what they always did, when ships would come into, uh, a lot of the ships that would come into New Orleans after they unloaded the ships, they would then dismantle it and use the wood to build houses and buildings and stuff. So the, the traders and stuff, fur traders and, and stuff that were coming over the mountains to, to Pittsburgh, you know, there's fantastic hardwood forest all around there. They would cut down a bunch of those trees and, and uh, work them up into lumber and build big flat boats or, you know, like a big floating wooden barge kind of a deal with some living quarters on it. They would load them up full of furs and the things that they knew that the people in New Orleans needed, and they would float down the Ohio River to the Mississippi, and then float down the Mississippi River to New Orleans. They would sell all their goods plus the boat, which would be disassembled, you know, and and the wood used to build houses and stuff and buildings. They would then canoe. They would canoe back up the river as far as about where Vicksburg, Mississippi is, or excuse me, Natchez, Mississippi Natchez. is. Natchez. And um, and that was about as far as they could go without the, the current getting too stiff. And once they would get to Natchez, they would get off the canoe and they would walk. Uh, the, the trace turns out to be a shortcut. And uh, it runs basically southwest to northeast so they would walk the trace that old indian trail and come out up near nashville and you're on the cumberland river there and they they're there at nashville they could sort of get resupplied and then go on the rest of the way either they could either start over right there and build flat boats and crap right around nashville and float down the cumberland which goes into the ohio and back to new orleans or they could go on and keep on going back up to the pittsburgh area Wow. So that's how the Natchez Trace uh, became a, a major trade route in the in the early United States. Uh, but uh, but what's funny is all of the things that brought the animals and the and the Native Americans there in the first place, they're all still there, all of it. And there are a surprising number of Indian mounds up and down the Trace. Mm -hmm. And um, if you don't mind me asking, this sure. is, is, I'm going to jump over to Poverty Point in Louisiana because you uh -huh. know that's a big that's a big. Um, there's a lot of bounds there, and um, 
my dad is he was from franklin parish and i know like this is one of the things we that when i first started talking to cecil and tully and stephen that um we were talking about were the giants but in winsboro louisiana they had uncovered one of those um skeletal remains of a giant and they mm-hmm. also some ladies that i know their sisters their grandparents have a have some property that they all grew up on in vidalia louisiana which is across from natchez mm-hmm. and they had giants that were dug up on their land there were there were giants dug up in an indian mound on the trace uh, there was a uh, there was a and this was I was living over there when the the excavation was going on, and I got to know the uh, the lady who was in charge of it. I was very interested in what they were, you know, what was going on over there. And uh, they dug up under a big slab, a, a big slab of of a uh, of uh, sort of. There's a rock called Jasper that Jasper, Alabama, is named after. And Jasper is sort of an in-between stage between limestone and marble. And they dug up a slab of Jasper that was like four and a half feet wide and somewhere around 11 or 12 feet long and four to four to five inches thick. And you can imagine what that weighed. I mean, thousands of pounds. And the nearest place that that, that, that rock, could be found was near Jasper, Alabama and cross country. That's like 90 miles or something. And they've, they've never, they couldn't figure out how they got that rock that heavy 90 miles when without using wheels or anything the, the wheel had not been discovered in America when those mounds were built. And, uh, that we knew of, but anyway, uh, and underneath that slab, when they when they finally moved it and pulled it out of the way, there was a ten foot tall male skeleton and about an eight and a half foot tall female skeleton. Wow! And now get this: they were dressed in full regalia. They had on they had on feather capes, and if if you've studied anything about uh, much much about the tribes, and, and even over in Hawaii. These feather capes were the highest uh, form of um, of garb, ceremonial garb that they wore, and it, it, it was reserved only for like royalty. And uh, the 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 thing had had everything from hummingbird feathers to cardinal feathers to uh, bluebird feathers, indigo bunning feathers, uh, you know, these different types of feathers all made into a cape and um and both of them had on these go- what's called a gorget it's a it's a like a ceremonial necklace that's made in- very intricately but it was very obvious that these giants were very extremely highly revered members of the tribe or the group that built that mound wow uh, and you know what happened to those skeletons the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian. <laughs> <laughs> I went down there one day after work to see what they'd found. I was really wanting to know what they found under that slab. I go down there, and the lady who was in charge of the dig was sitting there, and she was throwing stuff mad and crying. I said, what in the world? What's going on? And she told me that, that these people from the Smithsonian uh, showed up and took the skeletons. That's a pretty and, common experience. And, and, and all the artifacts and ordered them. They had somebody with them that had the authority to order them to fill in the dirt and put back certain one, certain items of the, the stuff that they'd found put the slab back in place, cover it all up and put seed out and leave it alone. Why do you think they do stuff like that? Why wouldn't they just let us know it for sure? Because now they even try to suppress that things like that ever even existed. Well, 
you got to realize who who's the money who is the money behind the smithsonian true <laughs> well i mean if they don't no, want us to know their mountain lines in the state why would they want us to think they were giants oh uh, the money behind the smithsonian is the catholic church yeah and i'm not afraid to say it and they and they uh and Bigfoot doesn't fit into their little tight little neat package of creation. Yeah. And yeah. that's why I get this. You ever done a little study on St. Christopher? Yes, a little bit. All right. You ever gone back and looked at the ancient pictures of St. Christopher, paintings of St. Christopher? Yes. He, was, he, was a get it. he is this See, they have wiped out. He was a member. He was a he was a kind of cephali. That that was a race, a recognized race that they occupied a large area of northwestern Africa. They also occupied a pretty good size area over in, in India. The and this is after the pharaohs had all been done away with in Egypt. This this where Saint Christopher came from and. Uh, I know you guys probably don't know this, but I'm gonna I'm sharing this for the people that don't know this. You go back, get just Google Saint Christopher. Don't look at the the modern renderings or pictures of him or what he was supposed to look at. Mm. Keep going back. Look at yeah. the stuff from back in the from back in the 1200s and the in the 1300s and stuff like that. It'll show you that he was a, he was basically a dog man. Mm -hmm. Or a dog-headed human, but he was also a giant. Now, what uh, does that make? Does it make? There you go. Yep. There you go. There he is. And, and read the story of read the story about him, how he came to be a saint. The Reader's Digest version is that the king of Egypt that was. There at the t at the time, sitting on the throne of Egypt, decided he wanted to open trade routes with the Kinocephali. I don't know if you call it empire, but they're they're uh, into their area. The town of, of what is now uh, Timbuktu, I think, was sort of the center of their. I, I don't like I said I don't call it an empire, but that was sort of the center of the of their nation or the area that they occupied there in. Northwestern Africa. So he sent emissaries to, along with some of his uh, soldiers to guard them into the kind of empire that this dog man empire and the dog man killed him, killed every one of them. That's wild. So he sent, he sent, uh, some more over there with 800 of his personal guard or his personal soldiers. They killed all of them, but, but just a few, there was a few managed to escape and make it back and tell the King what was going on. So the King, part of the problem was, is when they encountered these people, they'd never seen anything like this and it scared them half to death. And, you know, they just want to get out of there. They don't want to stand and fight these these monsters, these <laughs> ten foot tall, ten to twelve foot tall, you know, wolf headed or dog headed monsters. So he hand picked. I think the next time he sent sixteen hundred and a, a hand picked warriors along with these emissaries. And, oh, and they had figured out who was leading them. Uh. Uh, who was who was the, the the guy that was in charge of this? It was basically their border guard people <laughs> and uh, <laughs> their border patrol people. And <laughs> I, I wish we had a bunch of them on our south borders right now, but uh, that's that's another story. But anyway, so they took off over there, and they encountered them again. And these guys stood in 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 fault. And they spotted the guy that they wanted to catch, and they 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 managed to 
cut him away from his troops and they managed to kill enough of them that they were able to capture him. And the story of, of what it took to actually chain him up and subdue him was, is, is pretty wild. But uh, anyway, they brought him in chains and, and bindings back to Egypt, to the king. And the king decided he didn't want to kill him or anything like they would do. A, a lot of times they would do with their enemies. They'd bring him back and he'd execute him right there on, in the, on the, the court of the palace. He actually decided he wanted to convert him to Christianity. And so they locked him up and the king with great patience made friends with him and started teaching him about Jesus. And he did. He converted into Christianity. I can't remember how long that happened, how long it took for that to happen. Once he, once he converted into Christianity and he was sure that he was, that he was a Christian and he wasn't faking it. He told him, he said, I want to establish trade with your, with your people. Would you accompany me personally back to see your king? And he said, okay. So off they go. And they get they get back over there to about the border between Egypt and the Kinocephali kingdom. And they get attacked by by soldiers led by his his uh, replacement. Wow. Well, he knew that somehow what he did, the only way he could get away is he had to wade out into the Mediterranean. He knew where there was some sandbars or something out there, and he waded way out. Now, he was actually like 12 feet tall or something like that. He put the king up on his shoulder and waded out, waded way out to where his his com, you know his uh, former compatriots couldn't couldn't get to him, and he saved the king's life. Wow. And that's how he became sainted and became Saint Christopher. And now, whether or not I, I can't remember uh, if he eventually made it to Timbuktu and actually ever was able to establish trade trade relations with that empire, but uh, but he did saved the king of Egypt's life. So the little, the fellow that you see on the St. Christopher medal and, and stuff and in the pictures sitting up, he's either got him, he's either got him holding him up like this or some, some of the pictures he's sitting on his shoulders. That's actually the king of Egypt. Wow. And that's how he, that's how he became the patron saint of travelers. That's so, so cool. Yeah. And, uh, and Hey, you don't have to take my word for this. You just get on there and get on Google and, and look it up. Just yeah. do some digging. Now, does the Catholic Church want you to know that that St. Christopher is a dog man? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, well, that's a good way to segue over to dog men. Yeah. Because yeah. I, yeah. I know that you, you're pretty familiar with that topic. Yeah. Mm. Here we go. There's o, there's Osiris right there. No, that's a new one. <laughs> Our dogs usually make appearances too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'm sure y'all heard Wilson. He's growling at Boo. So yeah. well, I usually just come in here and sit down. So. Yeah. Well, this one here, she has, she's not shy. <laughs> she's beautiful. But making her. Thank you. She's a, she's a rescue. What when I got her, talking? she was. She was five and a half months old. She only weighed 24 pounds. And the vet oh. said she was down to her last 24 to 48 hours before she'd have oh. starved to death. But we brought her back. Tully's reaching uh, out to me wanting to shout out the TikTok because he made a uh, one about the synocephaly. <laughs> so everybody go check out. Right. Kind of cephaly, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. You know, the, uh, some stuff I, I haven't been able to verify this. I came across some stuff here a year or so ago and I keep wanting to get over there and check, but that sort of alluded to the fact that one of the reasons that, that uh, if y'all remember the uh, Muslims invaded Northwestern Africa yeah. and, eventually, and eventually came across the Straits of um, 
Gibraltar into southern Spain. Yes. And it said that that they had decided that these dog men, this thing I can't, and I haven't been able to chase this down and verify this or not. So don't don't say, well, Kubo says, <laughs> you know, no, I'm saying I haven't had a chance to dig into this and I don't even remember the source. So, but it, what, it, what I came across is whoever wrote this uh, was alluding that the reason that the, that the Muslims conquered Northern Africa and came across the Straits of Gibraltar was to try to wipe out the Kinocephali empire. And uh, or cynocephalar, or kind of cephalar, but they were trying to wipe out these dog men. And it, once they wiped them out of Africa, they thought that some of them had escaped across the Straits of Gibraltar, and that's why they came into, you know, southern, uh, you know, southern Spain and, and Portugal. But now, I have not checked that out. I have no idea if that's true. I didn't check the the veracity of who wrote that. Uh, I just came across it. I found it. it was interesting. That's one of those things I got to come back and check out further. But uh, whenever I hear things like that, though, it automatically becomes fact. So <laughs> <laughs> no. yeah, we, we, we cover we cover all the all, all those topics like that. Well, every, there yeah. so. there was a Irish werewolf group that I say this. This is very poorly worded, but. Um, they were known to rescue children from bad men. Cool. Yeah, I, I can't think. Um, it's my Gaelic is very poor, so I'm just going to spell it. It's spelled F A O L A D H. So if you'll get a chance to research that, um, I found it when I was researching for one of my books, and I, you know, incorporate a lot of myths into my stuff, and it was really fascinating, but. It makes me think of this, and I wonder if there was another sect of these dog-headed men in Ireland. Mm. Yeah. Makes me wonder. Uh, th there were a few stories that went around during World War II about a, uh, a basically it would have been a dogman type creature, I think, that, I don't know, <laughs> participated in World War II or World War I. I can't, can't remember which one exactly. It's been too long since I've yeah. since looked over any of that but there were reports of it you know yeah so, so uh, steven steven's uh, steven's our resident bigfoot hunter <laughs> um but he seems to run into things more more things that aren't bigfoot than bigfoot most of the time so in your in your researches over the years and things like that what's the besides bigfoot what's the wildest thing that you ran into would you consider like well one thing that blew my mind is uh I was researching some sighting reports up on uh, in Cheha State Park in Alabama, and there had been a number of sighting Bigfoot sightings on a power line right away, right down below the the lodge, the the, the re lodge restaurant and the swimming pool. And I was um, walking up a trail that went out across this um, this power line right away. And all of a sudden, I, I saw this out of the corner of my eye. I saw some movement, and I looked around, and this gray thing had fuzzy edges. And this is in broad daylight, and it was it was opaque. I couldn't see through it, but it was a little bit smaller than a basketball. It shot out of these this brush that was on this power line right away and went sort of – Bouncing across, not not bouncing, but sort of like a bird flies. You know when they'll they'll fly like that. Went across the right away into the woods on the other side, and it just disappeared down into some brush. I'm like, what in the world was that? <laughs> now, uh, so I turned around, and got out of there. Have that what was? Uh, hang on, yeah, I have. All right, I don't. Y'all probably don't know that know this, but I was the first person in the Bigfoot world that I was the first person that figured out the Bigfoot use infrasound. Yeah, and we were. I was researching infrasound back in the early 1980s, 81, 82, and 83. I was researching the effects of infrasound way back then, 
I had read up on the French had studied using infrasound as a weapon in the late 70s. I read everything I could find on that. But I determined that, that Bigfoot in the 1980s, early 80s, I determined that Bigfoot were using infrasound. And I started studying the effects of it. What I didn't find out then, which I learned later, and this is very reproducible in the lab, I was using earthquake simulation machinery and instrumentation that was testing equipment going into nuclear plants all over the world to verify that, that they could operate safely through an earthquake. And we had we had several in the lab there, we had several large earthquake simulation machines. Well, it just so happens that earth and all that stuff runs in the frequency range between one half and 30 hertz or 32 hertz, something like that. When I say hertz, I mean frequency or cycles per second. Infrasound is, is by definition, is the range of sound below the human threshold, of, the threshold of human hearing, which is 20 hertz to zero hertz. So I've here I've been working with this with this infrasound range, but going a little bit further out into the audible range because earthquakes occur. The shaking and vibration that are produced by earthquakes are in the range of of a uh, zero to to uh, to a little bit of about 30, 32 hertz. So I got to mess around with it. What what gave me the idea was um, I had heard this low frequency buzzing or, or vibration when I was around turkeys that were strutting and drumming. And it and I had detected the same thing around when I was out researching Bigfoot. And I had tried to record it and I couldn't record it and just using you know regular recorders of the day. I even tried to record it on a really nice TAC reel to reel four channel tape deck and um couldn't get it. And when I got to digging, that's when I discovered that the reason I couldn't record it was the sound was probably below the frequency response of my microphone that I was using. Most of the microphones, even today, you buy a standard microphone like it, it only it cuts off at around 30 to 35 hertz. And then I but then I noticed that that uh, the stuff that we were using the, in the lab, all of these micro accelerometers and stuff, they would respond all the way down to a quarter of a hertz or a half of a hertz. And and I got to thinking, well, I could glue one of those things to a sheet of ultra lightweight mylar and suspend it real carefully. And uh, I knew that infrasound moves a lot of air. I, I, I knew that. And, uh, and that I could make my own infrasound microphone. So I managed to buy a couple of old uh, a couple of old accelerometers that, that were sort of being retired. And I talked somebody into selling me a couple of them. And I made my own infrasound microphone. And the trouble I had then was the actual record, re recording heads on my, my tape deck weren't good enough. But I was able to do a whole lot better than I could with anything else. And then I got to reading about a, Nikola Tesla, Nikolai Tesla, and he did a lot of studying of infrasound. And I read about the, the the famous thing where he and Mark Twain were buddies. And one of the things you do is you you could stand out on his shake table, and he'd run the frequency up to a, a certain point and make you feel real giddy. But if you get at, at a certain level and you go just a little bit off off of that. You reach what's you know, people call the brown frequency, <laughs> and uh, supposedly Mark Twain ruined one of his nice white suits <laughs> when uh, Tesla got off just a little bit on the frequency. But anyway, yeah. so I'm reading about what the French were doing. I, you know, even the the U.S. had experimented with it. The trouble with using infrasound as a weapon is you can't focus it. You know, it's like a when the way a subwoofer works, 
you know, you can put your subwoofer over in the corner behind the sofa and that, that really super deep bass stuff, it comes from all around you, you know. Uh, it's not it's not directional like the higher frequencies are. Yeah. So anyway, I found in, that I could reproduce a lot of the effects that I felt and that I saw happening to other people with uh when we were around Bigfoot, I could I could reproduce that in the lab. And then back in the um this would have been a back in about right around 2010 or so I ran across for some, some other guys were doing some more studies and they found that they could introduce if they, if they hit you with infrasound that was uh, uh, about the frequency that vibrated your eyeball, that, that you reach the resonant frequency of the human eyeball. Now, you can cause detached retinas, oh. but below that level, but at that, at that frequency, you can cause people to see apparitions. Wow. And the, and the most common apparition that people would see was a gray, fuzzy eyed, fuzzy edged, <laughs> opaque ball, a little bit smaller than a basketball. And when they would cut their eyes to look, it would move. And if it moved this way and they'd be trying to follow it, it would it run off. I thought, holy crap, that's what happened to me. I was getting zapped, I was getting zapped by infrasound down there in that area where a bunch of boogers had been seen, and uh, and I didn't re I didn't realize it because you can't hear it. No, uh, no. And well, I've got to ask this because I I have experienced the infrasound before. Yeah, you feel it. Uh, I'll go ahead and tell you mine with. with I think I've actually had it happen to me a couple of times, but that, that I'm aware of. But but the second time it was a uh, basically I could feel a it was, it was it was a vibration basically from my hips to my shoulders is what I could feel. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh, have yeah. you, uh, has anybody else told you they experienced something like that? Yeah, you, know, you can feel. You, yeah. Yeah, you can you can feel it in your bones and such. And one. I, just a minute. Let, let me let her out or something. I'll be right back. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see so it. All right. yeah, it was, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Some of the What's your major malfunction, dog? So yeah. that's obviously like a defense system. Well, yes. So y'all know I have yeah. um, kidney issues. And the other day I had to go have an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And you can feel that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Because that machine is <laughs> it's, it's spinning, you know. If unless I'm getting confused with a CT scan, it's a, you know. But oh, well, that's what I mean. Is you can you can feel and hear that stuff. I mean, mm -hmm. that's a lot. Yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry. I'm if she gets to raising cane in there, I'll have to let her out. I'll take her out, and I can't just let them out unattended out here at, at, at night. Yeah. We, we have. have understand oh yeah, yeah we, we have, well we have multiple packs of coyotes around here and this is the time of year that they like to uh go out challenging dogs and killing dogs and stuff yeah because they're they're very territorial this time of year because it's the, their breeding season we have boogers around here that like to eat dogs and we have skunks that the dogs like to catch and then get sprayed by <laughs> yeah <laughs> My younger male dog has got sprayed three times in less than two weeks. Here, oh, no. about two week, about two weeks ago. And uh, uh, anyway, there's and in on top of all that, we've got a hybrid wolf wandering around here that I've seen him twice. Wow! And he's and he's gotten after my dogs both times. Yeah. He, he tried to kill. He tried to catch Jake. I mean, my, my Joe, my younger shepherd. And if I hadn't been there, he would have caught him. And uh, I was able to myself charge at him, yelling and screaming and stuff. And and uh, and finally, when Joe came past me, it finally, this thing has unbelievable concentration. He finally saw me and stopped. And then last, just here a few days ago in broad daylight, 
he tried to, uh, he attacked my old, I've got an old 14 year old retired uh, canine unit from the LA County Sheriff's Department, Los mm. Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And this thing just last week attacked, uh, attacked old Jake. And um, if it hadn't been for, and I was outside, and I didn't have a gun with me. And uh, if it hadn't been for Joe and, and Niffy, that, that thing would have killed Jake. He uh, actually knocked him down and was was trying to go after his throat or, and everything. And, and Joe, Joe managed to knock him off of, of Jake. And um, Niffy got a few good bites in on his butt. And uh, <laughs> by, by this time, I had run in the house and grabbed a shotgun and came running back out and fired a. Actually, no, I didn't get shotgun. I grabbed my little Ruger LCP <laughs> and uh, and came out and fired three shots down in that direction, but over their heads. And that broke his concentration enough that Jake was able to get away. And, uh, that's, that's terrifying. Yeah, it is terrifying. So that's why I can't let them outside at night yeah. unattended. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we understand. I mean, yeah, we don't, yeah. I don't. I don't personally have those issues, but um, yeah. Well, I had never never known of a wolf to be around here this close, but we do have. There is uh, native populations of, of red wolves around here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now down in Mississippi, where I lived. Uh, the last place I lived in Mississippi before I moved to Missouri um, back in 2002, I lived right on, I lived in a, on a little Island in a bayou down there, not far from the trace. And um, there were two packs of red wolves in the area. And I lived right on the border between the two packs. <laughs> I'd, go to, I'd go to sleep at probably three or four nights a week, listening to them howling back and forth. And that was freaking awesome. I loved it. Love that. They uh, they did come up and kill. They killed and uh, uh, no, they didn't. I'm, I'm wrong. I had a booger come up and kill one of my German shepherds that I had back then. And, uh, and tore it apart and uh, left me about a softball sized chunk of meat with the hair and the hide still attached to it. Oh man, that's horrible. Yeah, that yeah. was horrible. I hated yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, cool. Kumbo, when I talked to you last last Saturday, you'd ask if any dogs around here had gone missing, and uh, yeah. I had forgotten about it at the time. But my neighbor had a uh, Great Pyrenees and something else. He was a huge dog, mm -hmm. and he went missing, and he didn't get hit on the highway or anything. So that that was one that I had forgotten about. He was a big dog, yeah. and uh, you know I I've told you about. Some of them that I've had, you know, the boogers that come up around a tree line mm -hmm. here around my property and stuff. And she actually saw, I'm pretty sure it's one I got a picture of uh, there one night. Yeah. And she wasn't fast right. enough to get a get her AR up <laughs> and take a shot. Yeah. Wow. Well, let me, t let me tell y'all, uh, I'm going to tell y'all and anybody that watches this or anybody that's listening now or in chat right now. We're entering the toughest time of the year for predators, yeah. and especially om omnivorous animals like uh, like Bigfoot. They've used, they've eaten up all of the mast that, like acorns and stuff like that, acorn and acorns and nuts that were in the woods in the earlier in the in the in the fall and earlier in the winter. They've eaten up all the stuff that was left over in the gardens and stuff uh, from the previous summer. They've eaten up all the the leftovers the, the, from harvesting the crops, you know, uh, corn and stuff that was dropped, uh, soybeans that were dropped, little patches that were missed, all that's gone now. The only thing uh, there is, we're here, nothing is greened up yet. There's nothing growing. There's no, there's no vegetable matter that left out there other than, they can strip bark off some trees, right? This time of year, they'll strip bark off of cedar trees and things, and they'll find the, the wild cherry trees that have the little globs of jelly stuck to the bark. They'll eat that kind of stuff, but that's not enough to sustain these animals. So they're depending almost 100% on protein, and where they get that protein, they 
like right here, my farm's on the Tennessee River, and they'll they'll you'll see them a lot. There's this time of year they're seen a lot, and, and on up until about May, they're seen a lot in the river. They're they're in there fishing. You know, they they're fast enough and good enough they catch the fish with their hands. Yeah, but they're also boogers have a love hate relationship with coyotes. They let the coyotes follow them around and hang around them and stuff all the rest of the year. But this time of the year, they start they start knocking them off and yeah. uh, using them for food. Now they're smart enough; they're very very good managers of of their area. They won't kill them all off because they understand that they have to leave enough for seed. But they'll also start catching a lot of pets. They'll catch dogs and and cats and They'll also start carrying off hogs and, and calves and things like that. Um, but this is the time of, of the year from from now until green up, until you're fi- starting to find the first fruits of things in the garden and, so, and a few berries and things start to, to be available. They are, they are really bad to, uh, to kill dogs and cats and pets and, Colts and calves and and stuff like that and coyotes and you know anything that they can get a hold of, including people. Mm. If you study, if you study, if you study mysterious disappearances of people and and uh, one of the things you'll find is, and you know I I have to give old. Pilates credit, he stumbled, he figured out something that I had known for years. And I first heard about this in 19, in the late sixties from Jacques Cousteau, the, the, the real famous diver uh, that used to be on the national graphic geographic specials. Yeah, he, he, got, he got, my dad used to be a County commissioner and plus he was an auxiliary sheriff deputy. <clears throat> And so when somebody would go missing around here, he was in sometimes to be involved in, you know, helping to look for it. And I remember we were watching this Jacques Cousteau special and he was talking about that they've had to change their dive suits, that their dive suits, some of them were solid yellow and some of them had, had yellow trim on them. And they found out for some reason that, that, predatory fish, sharks and barracudas and moray eels and stuff like that and other things would attack those yellow suits or attack the yellow trim on their suits. Wow. And he's and so they they changed to a different color. And so in fact he I remember the, the words out of his mouth that he, they started calling it yum yum yellow. <laughs> and I remember my dad, I looked over and my dad was sitting there shaking his head. Like really? that, yeah. And I wondered, what does he know about this? And uh, I tried to talk to my dad about about Bigfoot and things several times, and he wouldn't talk. One time, my mother was trying to tell me something that had happened out here, and Daddy shushed her up, wouldn't let her tell me. And this is after they knew I was a grown man; they knew I was researching Bigfoot. My dad, my own dad, wouldn't talk to me about it, but uh. Now my grandfather did, and my grandmother did, and, and such. But uh, but and I knew that they knew. I knew my mom and dad both knew about them. They just didn't want to talk about it, or my dad didn't want to talk about it. But anyway, one of the things I got to noticing uh, when I would uh, hear about a disappearance of somebody, and is I paid close attention to what they were wearing, and I noticed. Several cases where people, when they were describing what they have on last, they'd have like a yellow T-shirt or a yellow raincoat or something. The other color was red. Red, and I, I call them. I call those two colors yum yum yellow and dead red. And when I'm going out in the field and anybody's going to be going to me, I tell them, do not wear yellow or red. Yeah, you can wear any other color you want to. Do not wear yellow or red. You can wear orange. Somehow they, I think because of hunter orange, they they associate orange with danger because the hunters are all carrying guns. But uh, 
I've I've read uh, what's interesting in some of the national parks. That's right. I don't know if you can still do it, but like uh, I found one for the for uh, I found them for the Grand Canyon for Arches Canyon Land. Uh, the the those three part three or four parks in Utah: Arches Canyon Land, Capitol Reef, Zion, and Bryce Bryce's Canyon, and Grand Staircase Escalante. And it's it's lists or, or cases of people that have died or disappeared in the yeah. national park. Missing 411. I know it's not missing 411. It's it's stuff written by park rangers and stuff. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah, they're out there. You can you can look. I mean they're usually found in the visitor center in you know, in one of the visitor centers. Well, one of the best the best ones that I found in a long time I found there at the Grand Canyon a few years ago. But it was very, very detailed and, and you know, told about if they found the person or if they did not. And when they disappeared, what were they wearing? And I was astounded how many were wearing red or yellow. And it didn't even have to be a full outfit. It could be just like a pair of red running shorts. And they might have had a blue T-shirt on or something or a white T-shirt or, you know, a black T-shirt or something. Or, or they might have had on yellow running shoes. It, it was crazy. But I was astounded how many of these people that disappeared had uh, had on yellow or red. Now, I got involved in a disappearance. I was asked by a family member to get it to come and help an investigation that was going on in Arkansas of a family member that disappeared. And the first thing I did, I got to reading the account about it. She was wearing a yellow raincoat when she disappeared. Wow. Yeah. And I, um, I don't want to go into details on, on a public forum like this, but, <laughs> but we were able to we were able to determine exactly, almost exactly where she disappeared from, from eyewitnesses that were there. And it was astounding. There was a, a little curve in the trail that wasn't but forty feet long, and she disappeared right in that forty foot area where she was out of sight of her. A family member and a and a park ranger. That's where she disappeared from, and I'm confident that she became a meal. And wow. uh, I was asked one time by a uh, member of the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation to look at some case files, and uh, I was handed I was shown a stack of 19 case files. Of, of missing persons in a seven county area of Alabama and Mississippi and asked if there was any of those to look them over and if there was any of those I thought could be Bigfoot related. And there were some of them that I were pretty certain were Bigfoot related. And uh, uh, I was asked to meet an, an FBI agent up in a Cecil up, not sort of in your, your neck of the woods, sort of. Yeah. And, uh, in the edge of Daniel Boone, where they had found a guy had been killed and folded backwards and stuffed into his truck. And they found, uh, evidence that he had shot something big found tracks and stuff like that. And that was definitely Bigfoot related. He didn't disappear, but he'd been killed. And uh, he actually, what we figured out is he had shot a, he'd shot a booger. Wow. And was attacked by the rest of the troop and killed. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, so, uh, you know, and it's amazing how many disappearances around the country happen in this time of the year from about, you know, mid January to, to up around May, you know, sometime in May. It's, well. it's, yeah. if you get to, if you get to digging into it. Uh, and it, the, and it oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. 
Um, this is the first time I've ever made this connection because you you said it wasn't tied to the Mission Four One, but the Mission Four One's expanded to like all the national parks and everything. You have all these disappearances. Uh -huh. You said most of the time the people are either wearing red or yellow, and so uh -huh. that's pretty wild. I've never I don't know why I've never connected that before because I knew about the red and yellow anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. And like I said, I have I have to give Pilates credit because. I had never said anything about that. He didn't learn that. He didn't learn that from me or any other Bigfoot researcher I know. He got to give the man credit. He came up with that on his own. That's wild. And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you you said earlier you estimate there's about a hundred thousand within the United States. Yeah. Uh, so what's the chances that the that there is a correlation because mo most people right now are thinking that it has something to do with the cave systems that run through the national parks too, with all these missing people too. So obviously this is probably tied into the Bigfoot area, right? Like they well, all, everything's kind of in intertwined basically. I have a very large cave on my farm. The national speleological society has been in there mapping it several times. They've already mapped over three miles of passages and they say that they're, they have just touched, just scratched the surface. Wow. Wow. They are definitely living in part of that cave. Wow. Absolutely, positively. Um, cool. I've been in that cave numbers of times, never encountered one in there. Nobody I've ever heard of has encountered them in there. However, the endangered uh, little gray bat or little brown bat, is it's a, they use it as a maternity cave. Back in the... Um, uh, can't remember. It was in the eighties. Uh, they were studying it. There's a guy we call him the Batman. He comes here twice a year, <laughs> and he's, he sets up this electronic array and these little ultra fine nets. He catches some of the bats and then checks them over, checks their health. But then he uh, he also counts counts them as they come and go. And uh, he counts them as they leave in the evening and as they come back in the morning. Wow. Uh, but uh, anyway, because uh, they're this endangered bat, they talked my dad into letting them put a fence around the mouth of the cave. So they did that. And there's a, a gate there that you can walk through. And they had asked my dad to... Uh, so that we could get in there if we needed to, for some reason, to put a lock, put a big lock on that gate and then let them have one of the keys. So my dad went down there and locked the gate one evening, one afternoon. And for some reason, he came back the next morning. The fence had been something super heavy had jumped up and grabbed a hold of the top of the fence. This is there's a it's an eight foot fence around there. Somebody got a hold of the top thing of the fence and just jerked it down. <laughs> <laughs> and now my dad called me up and, and now he was pretty excited about that. So at that time I weighed over a hundred pounds more than I do now. I weighed up above somewhere else above 340, 345 pounds. And I had a research partner that weighed similarly, maybe even more. So that weekend we took off over there, came home and we went down there and daddy showed me, showed it to us. We're amazed. So the two of us together weighed, a little in excess of 700 pounds, probably about 720, 730 pounds. We jumped up right beside each other and grabbed a hold of the top bar of that fence. 725, 730 pounds. We didn't budge it. We started jerking and pulling and all that mess and, and doing it together. We could not pull that thing down. Wow. Now, <laughs> That's I have done... I grew up around cattle and showing cattle and stuff like that. And, and, you know, hearing my dad talk about cattle and all this mess and hogs and stuff. So I'm a pretty good judge of what things weigh. 
<laughs> and I've and of the boogers and stuff that I've seen, the ones that live here on the farm are the what I call the type ones, the patty types. They're the biggest, the heaviest of the of the ones that I know about. And I've said I've said for a long time that the big alpha males, the ten footers, that they probably weigh around eleven 1, hundred to twelve hundred pounds. Now, I have seen one and only one a 12 footer down in Texas. And I didn't believe what I was seeing until I found out a couple of ladies lived in the area. Oh yeah. They know about him. He's been around here for years. Yeah. He's 12 foot tall. <laughs> <laughs> now, unfortunately that was passed away. He's, he's not around anymore, but, uh, but that was a pretty well locally, very well known one. And, so I figured that dude probably, that dude was probably, the, the, the weight goes up a bunch as the height goes up. Yeah. I figured that dude's a minimum of 1,400, 1,500 pounds, possibly as much as 1,600, 1,700 pounds. Yeah. Now, I may, now people going to say that I've lost my mind, but. You look at a you look at a fifteen hundred pound bull, and look at a twenty one hundred pound bull, yeah. and, and to the untrained eye, there ain't much difference. But if you know what you're looking at, you can say, "Boy, that is a twenty one hundred pound bull." <laughs> and uh, and uh, I've killed a lot of I've killed over two hundred buck deer in my life, and um, well in excess of two hundred buck deer, and uh. I've killed bucks as small as 75 pounds. And I've killed them as large as, you know, 330 something pounds. And, uh, and I've killed a whole bunch from the 175 to about 260 pound range. And when you first look at them, you know, it's hard to guess, you know, well, that's a, what was that thing weigh, you know? And, do you go hang them on the scale? Oh, wow. That thing weighs 270 pounds, you know, <laughs> or 260 pounds. But, uh, I, but like I said, I'm, I'm confident that that 12 footer weighed in excess of 1400 pounds. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm confident as many times as I've seen them as, as folks that work here on the farm have seen them as, as, Relatives and friends have seen them. That the the big alphas that live around here, that the type one, the patty type, that they run around eleven hundred pounds. But, uh, and and I forget what the whole point of what kind of question I was even trying to answer. I got off the track. Um, I mean, it is really hard to judge weight. Like people tell me all the time now, I don't look as fat as I do. I think they're being nice. Like I'm three hundred seventy <laughs> pounds, but I'm only six foot four. So something that's yeah. Something that's twelve feet tall can easily weigh a thousand pounds, especially yeah. if they're all packed with muscle too. Yeah, there ain't much fat on them. No, but so. um, uh, you know, that's that's another thing. You know, I I was the first one that started trying to classify the different types that I came across, and uh, now you know, there's people who got all different kinds of stuff. I do know this. Are you guys ever, ever y'all ever heard of something called the Miller document? The Miller document. I think I have heard of that. I can't remember it. Right it's, worth, it's, it's worth, it's worth looking it up and reading. And, uh, I've studied it very closely. Oh yeah. And if it's a hoax or a fake, whoever did it spent a tremendous amount of time putting together the taxonomy that's why I think it's for real because it would have taken, it would have taken somebody. There's, there's no way somebody would have had, would have had the patience to, to, uh, hoax that. Cause if you, if you, if you look at, if, if somebody is, is a, is a biologist and understands taxonomy, he describes six different varieties and he's got the full taxonomy of, of each. Right. And that's all the Latin names and all that kind of crap. If you take the time to dig through that, you realize that that uh, uh, it's not a bunch of made up gobbledygook. It's it's for real. I mean, it's 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 real stuff. 
and and it would be exceedingly unlikely that somebody would have sat down and um i mean you whoever put that together to begin with had to be even that assigned the taxonomy to these different varieties was was one heck of a well experienced um uh biologist i guess or, or anthropologist or something i don't know what you i don't know what you call them but uh uh but you know i i, I spent a good bit of time going through the taxonomy and and doing a sanity check on it all and it was it's all for real he did like I said, this guy identified six different varieties of, of bigfoot and you know he supposedly was a, was a biologist or an anthropologist or something for the government for years and he knew he was dying and he produced this document for his wife and uh to you know I, I don't remember the details of it but anyway he came up with this document uh that was sort of a synopsis of his studies over the years what he did his wife never knew exactly what he did and uh, just to sort of explain to to her and her and the family, you know what he had done, done for years, and uh, but in the Miller document they talk about six varieties. Uh, I've come across three varieties. I know that in the document there's one or two of the varieties that are that are West Coast only. There is there is one that he describes that has evolved. Is his feet the their feet have morphed over the years and evolved to uh, to where they're they're mostly arboreal, mm. but of course for a bigfoot to be arboreal, you know, live mostly in trees, we're talking about the big sequoia and redwood forest, yeah, most likely, or you know, in the Cascades and stuff, or maybe up in the maybe on up into the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest. But, um, but then you say, well, how come they never cut down a, a sequoia or a redwood and it hits the ground and a bunch of boogers run out of it like, <laughs> like, like, like you do around here with flying squirrels or squirrels or raccoons or foxes. And, uh, uh, but there's so many things covered up and, and, uh, right. back when I was, traveling a lot more than I am now, I had quite a few law enforcement uh, contacts. And it was amazing that the things that I would find out where the park service, you know, somebody, in fact, there was a one I found out two different ways I found out about it. one from a sheriff's deputy and one from a, a park ranger <laughs> where a, a booger was hit and killed on the Natchez Trace near Collinwood, Tennessee. Wow. And the uh, the uh, whatever county that is up there, I, I can't remember the name of the county. They sort of blocked the road and and secured the area until the park rangers could get there. And then the park rangers there, and they're trying to figure out, well, what are they going to do? And about this time, here comes a van and a and a and a something like a like a big F two fifty van and a and a a uh, uh, like a Tahoe or a Suburban comes whooping up. They were painted. Both people, both the deputy and the ranger told me that they were dark navy blue. These men in black got out, showed them some credentials, sent them, sent them up and down the highway to block the entrances, entrances uh, onto the, and the exits on off of and on to the, uh, the parkway there. And, and secure that secure that area. And oh, by the way, the the family that hit them, they got them back off the way. And when they when the deputies got there, the family was huddled in their station wagon, while there were a bunch of boogers up in, in the tree line along the edge of the trace, pelting them with rocks and stuff, you know, and <laughs> hollering, and screaming, and yelling. Yeah, and uh, hit hitting the car, not not hitting the people, but hitting the car. And and yelling and screaming and carrying on, and uh, so they they 
got the people off and got them off to the side. Side, and then, uh, yeah, I've heard that. I've heard this too, uh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. everybody. Told me. Yeah, he, he should have been. But over anyway, <laughs> but anyway, they 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 sent the 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 trace rangers and the and the uh in the sheriff's department personnel up and down you know a ways to secure that area and he said and my 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 ranger friend was down on the south end these vehicles came from the north like coming from nashville uh my uh my sheriff's deputy friend who grew up just right down the road from where i'm sitting right now he uh he says that that uh, all, here, here, all of a sudden, here comes the suburban in the van, and came on by, and uh, the van went on, and the suburban said, "Where's the where are the you know the people that hit that hit the thing?" They told him, and they went off with them, and I don't know if they got their little red flasher out. And <laughs> <laughs> they, they had they had a little come to Jesus meeting with the family and. And then let them go, and and then they then they headed back north. So yeah. uh, uh, now, um, Hadley, yes. there is. I'm not I'm not going to say the name of it, but um, you know the area down in down uh in near your part of the trace. There is a. Um, Well, I can't say this without giving it away. There's one of the parks there. I'll just say that. You know, people don't know the tracers. Every few miles, there's a little park, a little picnic area you can pull off. And it, and it, and it's something significant happened there, or there was something significant about that area. Like there's Indian mounds there, or there's a salt lick there, or there's a passenger pigeon roof roost, or there was a French trading post here, or this area was supposedly haunted, like witch dance. Yeah. And uh, all right, there's an area in the southern half of the trace, and uh, I had been down to uh, Jackson for an EPA meeting, and was coming home, and I had noticed it when I went down, and I saw it when I was coming back, and um, I had stayed in a motel down there that was dog friendly. So I had my, my German shepherd bow with me and, uh, uh, and so I decided to pull off at this, at this, uh, at this park. Cause there, you know, some interesting stuff there. And it was a nice park. It had a real nice walk, you know, paved walkway and it had a little kiosk that had dioramas and stuff that described what, what used to be there and, and things. And it was really interesting. And I'm walking around there, and I was about a third of the way into it, and uh, on this this path with, and th and I was the only person in the park. Me and Bo were the only only things there. Now that my my truck was the only vehicle that was in there, and Bo was a big chicken. And when we got close to boogers, he would run and he would run back to the truck, and he'd either he usually would jump up jump up on top of the toolbox in the bed. And and then sit there and stare, you know, want me to come, you know, <laughs> want me to leave. Sometimes he would go under the truck, but anyway, he he all of a sudden he took off, ran to the truck, and he jumped back up on, jumped up on top of the toolbox, and he's up there whining. I said, "Well, crap, there's boogers around here somewhere." And I got to looking around, and within fifty yards of me. 50, 60 yards of me, the only thing, the largest thing in the, that was there was some little pine trees that were no more than this big around. I mean, they weren't but about two and a half, three inches tall. I mean, a diameter of their trunks. They were about eight, eight, nine feet tall. And it was all cleaned up nice. You could walk through there. There was no briars or anything. And I said, there's got to be some boogers around here somewhere. And I'm looking, I'm down there looking around and, and stuff, and he's whining. And uh, I became aware of this noise, 
and it was a car hauling butt down the trace. I mean, flying. The speed limit on the trace is 50, and I thought, that guy's going to get a ticket. And uh, I can't believe he's driving that fast down the trace, and all of a sudden I hear brakes. You know, somebody hits the brakes, and hear it slowing down as fast as it can slow down. This is in the days before decent anti-lock brakes, and he sort of screeched. His tires were just trying to lock up on him. He was slowing down as fast as he could. And all of a sudden, he whooped, this car whoops into the into the driveway coming into this park. It's a park ranger. <laughs> and he pulls up there, and he gets on the PA speaker. He said, this park is closed. Leave the park immediately. Leave the area immediately. Wow. And I'm like, uh, and I do like this, because I hadn't even got back to the main part I wanted to see. <laughs> there was still a couple of kiosks. And uh and I turn, turn and I and all of a sudden the guy gets out. This is what scared me. He gets out. I don't y'all can't see this. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he's got his well, here's my pistol. He's got his belt on and he comes walking up to me and he's like this. Got his hand on on the butt of his gun. And he <laughs> says he says, get in your vehicle. This park is closed. Get in your vehicle and leave immediately. Wow. He said, if you if you give me any more lip, and I hadn't said a thing, all I'd done was this. <laughs> and he, said, he said, if you give me any more lip, you'll be, a, I'll arrest you. And, uh, and I says, okay. So I got in, I went and got my truck. So I opened the door, Bo, right in the truck he goes, you know, and he's glad to get out of there. I, I, I leave and the guy, as I'm pulling out of the parking lot, he's right behind. He pulls up there and he pulls to the gate, pulls it shut and locks it. Wow. Now, That's a wild. You know, what? I had, I got threatened at work not long after that. Wow. And, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I came in and the plant manager was paging me, which was not unusual. And, um, uh, so I go in his office and he said, shut the door again, not unusual. I shut the door and he says, Baker, I told you when you went to work here that I didn't want to see or hear of you outside of this plant unless you won the lottery or won an election. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, what's this got to do with anything? And he says, if you think that I'm going to let your Bigfoot hobby jeopardize the most lucrative contract that we have, you've got another thing coming. The next time I hear about you messing around down on the trace and causing trouble and that the Rangers have to run you off, you're going to be fired. Do you understand me? Ooh, well, yeah, what, what did I do supposedly? And I tried to tell him, I tried to, and I got run out. Of, I got run out of that place. I got run out of another place where I had finally figured out how they were getting back places on the trace that used to have, weekly sighting reports of them, the boogers crossing the crossing the trace. I had finally figured out and then all of a sudden the 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 sighting report stopped. I had finally figured out what was going on there and how they were getting to the one side of the trace to the other. And I was investigating that and there's a nature trail on either side of the trace right there. And there's a parking lot, a designated parking lot back about 500 yards behind me. My truck was parked in a designated parking lot. I passed no keep out signs or anything. And I had just found how they were getting under the trace. And all of a sudden, five people show up, make me come out of where I was, walk me up on the side of the pavement, question me, and, uh, and, and some other things. So, you know, I think knowing what I know now, I should have probably checked my vehicle for some kind of tracking device. Probably. And uh, because, you know, 
I'm not trying to brag or anything like that at all. Um, absolutely not, God. But at that time, I think I was probably myself and Bill White were probably the two leading Bigfoot researchers in the world that were actually out in the woods getting something done. Mm. And uh, I know we were definitely covering more ground than anybody else. And uh, the not finding Bigfoot people hadn't hadn't come on the scene <laughs> at, that, at that time at that point. And uh, now since then they've covered more ground than Bill or I have, but they ain't ever done anything. You know, it's all just Hollywood crap. Yeah. But you know, uh, I, and I, at that at that point in my life, I'd gotten to the point that I didn't care what people thought, and you know, I was telling things like, you know, that they climb trees and, uh, you know, the kind of places they hang out and just a lot of different things. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that the government thought I was a, a threat <laughs> and they were keeping talking to me. Well, I've got a question for you. Yeah. So you've been at this, I mean, since childhood for the most part, I mean, like you have been, right. Just, I got real, I got real serious about it in 1975. Well, what's the one thing? I mean, I'm sure there's more than one, but what were you just hardcore a belief in 1975 that you've totally changed your outlook on in 2024? The existence of dog men. Really? Yeah. Which I didn't one? know that. I was hearing I was hearing dog men stories back then, but I I didn't believe them. I thought it was just somebody, you know, mist mistaken uh, a Bigfoot, you know, not seeing a Bigfoot ride or something. Or uh, and in 1980 in 1984, I finally had my nose rubbed in it enough that I realized that that there was such a thing as dog men. And I actually had to go back and re-interview people. I actually went back and re-interviewed people that I had interviewed in the 1970s <laughs> that, that I remembered that their descriptions didn't didn't jive with what with what with Bigfoot. But I wrote it down as a Bigfoot sighting anyway. I thought they were just mistaken. So I re-interviewed some people and they uh, well, I tried to tell you then. <laughs> and it was one of the, you know, this way this one guy acted. And I said, "Well, I didn't know these things existed, but uh, but yeah, I had to change my mind totally about dog men, and I had to go back and relook at a bunch of my reports, and and I figured out that a number of the reports were dog man reports and not Bigfoot reports. And then I had to come to grips that dog men existed. Wow. But I never saw I never saw one myself until until april of of 22 you know, what was that like you mean what it looked like or what was it like seeing it just both. <laughs> I, I was i had sold a house and i was over there retrieving the last junk out of the house and i was coming back out here to the farm and uh and it was uh right after dark and i was on a pretty desolate road it's not too terrible about five miles from here it's crow flies and i was coming into a uh a, a gentle left-hand curve and i had my high beams on and there's a you're, you're crossing a creek bottom right there and there's a, a large very large culvert that goes under the highway right there two-lane highway and uh and all of a sudden in my headlights uh, I saw this thing come walking up the, the side of the road up out of the creek bottom onto the edge of the pavement. I'm like, I thought at first I was looking at a booger when I first saw it. And then I, actually at the very first I saw it, I thought there was a big dog or a wolf or something coming up on the road. Then it just kept coming and coming and coming. I'm like, holy crap. That's a bit. No, it's not. That's a dog van. <laughs> Dumped on the brakes, and it when I hit the brakes, that's when it noticed me. It, it turned to its left like that and looked at me, 
and it immediately turned around and back down the bank. It went. And uh, well, I have uh, I've got these really good fog lamps, but they they shine out and down also, and I call them. They do such a good job of lighting up the sides. I call them my ditch lights. As I reach over and I hit the button and turn on the ditch lights because I knew it'd throw light down into that bottom on the side of the road. And I got on the brakes and I rolled down the window. I reach over and hit the button to roll down the window on the on the passenger side. And I roll up there and I'm looking. And all of a sudden, there the damn thing was. And it was standing there and the its head was about even with the with the pavement with the road. I mean, it's you know it's about if this is the road level, his head's about like this. Mm. But it's looking up at me, and it's baring his teeth and it's growling. It's got his ears pinned back and his nose is all curled up. And that dude's head was that wide between the ears. Wow! And that thing had a big old jug head on it, and uh, <laughs> and it's got this big old hump of uh, like a big man big old hump up on its back and and a big old mane of rough of fur on its back and i'm getting the damn chili bumps all over me just telling this <laughs> <laughs> but uh i'm not kidding either <laughs> anyway and i realized i'd stopped and that thing was sitting there looking at me and i was looking at it and it was growling and i realized and I, I could see the length of his arms and everything. I said, "Hell, that thing could just reach up and snatch me right out this window." I mean, we, we weren't we weren't six feet apart. I mean, I said, so that's when you burned rubber, right? Uh, <laughs> you peeled out. <laughs> I really don't remember exactly what I did. I like to think all, it. all I know. All I know is I opened up an, an extra super large, fat, uh, super fast acting can of get the hell out of Dodge. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah. and, uh, and I get get you know, get out of there. A, a can of gone. But I think so, what I did, I think my hand was still on the the window button. Maybe I don't know. I I think the very first thing I did is I hit the button to roll the window up, and I believe I did mash it, and. I, I remember as I took off, I was looking in the rear mirror to see if it came back up on the road, but it didn't. Well, my buddy Jimmy Osborne and I went back over there uh, a few days later, and we figured out from where his head was and everything and and measuring down to the where it was standing that the dude was around nine, nine and a half feet tall. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Now it wasn't near as massively built as a as a Bigfoot. You know, it's tall and it the, its waist was narrow. Now I don't know if it had a tail. I got no idea. That my lights weren't shining that far down. I could see him down to if he had a belly button. I could see him down about where his belly button would have been. You know, I don't know if he had one or not. But uh, uh, yeah. but I I could see. He had one of his hands up a little bit, and I could see his knobby fingers and his old knobby knuckles on that one hand, which I had seen. I've seen those in some photographs that that, uh, that I've seen before. Good fo good photographs of dog men. But uh, Stephen has one of the best uh, ones I've ever seen. Cool. I want to see that thing sometime. <laughs> but, uh, I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you the picture and and the trackway. All right. Well, in 19, I'm real curious to see what the trackway looks like because I've seen se several trackways that they leave and yeah, they're very, is, they're it, very distinctive. Yeah. I have, uh, this, this one right here is not real big. It's between five and six foot tall. And yeah. the, the tracks were only about four and a half inches wide. So. That's still, that's still significant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's match with it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to either. Uh, uh no, no, well, sir. So, but you would I'm ask. You would ask what you think about them. What I think about the dog man. Yeah. I used to be absolutely terrified of them, but uh, now I mean they're they're more common than what people realize. 
I think they're probably overall less dangerous than, than regular Bigfoot. Mm -hmm. um, well, see, that's always been my, my take. You hear people are just scared of them, but I've wondered if it's just some way that uh, there's a certain type of wolf that's evolved that way. If that makes I don't sense. Know. Well, you know, there's, I, I mean, know. you've seen, you're very into the outdoors. So I'm sure, you know, wolves mm -hmm. get big. I mean, they yeah. get real big. And, um, yeah, the, the, the male, the, the male red wolves that we used to see that I used to see over when I lived in Mississippi on a pretty regular basis, those things were 160, maybe every probably there was a few of them. A, a couple of them might've been 170, 175. You know, I, I, but they're real tall. They got like they're long legged. I'd say that's just probably the kin of St. Christopher. <laughs> Lived in those. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, um, yeah. I don't know what I would do if I'd see something like that. I've, I'm always packing heat, so my first instinct is probably not the right one. <laughs> well, I, I'm always, I'm usually always packing as well, and I, I had something a whole lot better on me that day than this little thing I just showed. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to shoot one. Uh, I'd pray that I'd probably just piss it off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, shooting is an absolute last last resort. You know, yeah. Dallas Gilbert. Y'all ever heard of Dallas? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Dallas was a fantastic researcher back in the back in the eighties and nineties, and uh, well, especially the nineties and the early two thousands. He had a really bad thing happen to him. He had a he and, uh, he and a research partner were setting out a recorder and uh, supposedly a, a booger grabbed him by the head and twisted his head, tried to tried to pop his neck and killed him and threw him over, threw him over his shoulder and went toting him off according to the other person. And, uh, and Dallas had a Ruger Super Blackhawk 44 Magnum on his hip and he came to, he was, his feet were hanging over the front of the, the booger's shoulder. And Dallas was just hanging there flopping, you know, like this, hanging down his back. And he came to, and he reached up there and he drew that 44 Magnum out of the holster. And, uh, and he thumb cocked it and he just reached back here and just stuck it up against something solid and pulled the trigger. Mm. And, uh, and when he did, the booger screamed and threw his arms up like that, and took off running like crazy, and Dallas fell off of his back. And he was never the same after that. And, uh, yeah, that would be. Yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, did he have on yellow or red? Just I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I'm sure I probably asked back at the time, but I don't remember the the answer. Uh, I used to keep uh, journals, journal books. I used to buy these. They were, I bought them in an office supply store. They were hard bound. They had a blue cover with like dark brown binding on them, like a blue canvas cover kind of a thing. And they had 200 pages in each one and they were numbered pages. They were college ruled. In other words, they were li had narrow lines on them. Right. So there, and there were 200 pages. I had six of them completely full which means I had 1,200 pages of sighting reports, wow. and incident reports. Now, not there was not one report on every page. Some of the reports took two or three pages. But when I got divorced from my first wife, all my stuff was in the house in, in an inter entertainment center. And she had told me multiple times I needed to come get my stuff. And I, I was off, you know, working out of state, living and working out of state. And, and I, I kept forgetting about it and stuff. Oh, it'll be okay. I'll be able to get it. And, and uh, she sold the house and she was moving out. And I wasn't around. And so all my stuff went on the street. So I lost, I lost decades of research notes and sighting reports and stuff. And, I yeah. hold out hope that somebody drove by and was like, I'm going to take this stuff, and they turn up. 
somewhere. Oh, if you're watching and you have those notebooks, please give them back. Well, there was also dozens upon dozens upon dozens of six-hour VHS tapes that had audio recordings on them. And uh, I had converted. Uh, we we had learned how to convert. Uh, certain there was three brands of stereo VHS machines that we learned how to convert over to uh, what we called poor man's audio tape and a uh, poor man's digital audio tape. And I had, I had jobs of, of tapes with uh, the audio. Uh-oh. Okay. Are we okay? Uh, are we? Yeah, we are. All right. But anyway, I lost a I lost a tremendous amount of work because I wasn't able to get over and get it. You uh, know. So, you know, there's absolutely no way possible that I can rem remember all the reports and, and de details of all the sightings that you know that I had recorded over the years, and. My intention was is to, at some point to try to compile all those into a, a book and, and we were going uh, we were going to put them in a database and you know of course that opportunity's gone. Uh, and then at different times during my research career, all of my computers would suddenly get fried. My hard drives would go belly up my my uh, uh, my flash drives would all get smoked. Uh, I lost in a in a in a two week period. I lost one time. I lost um, twelve. Uh, no, I lost eleven flash drives, and um, two, three, five hard drives. Wow! In a two week period, and I sent one of the hard drives and one of the flash drives off and paid a pretty good sum of money to get the data recovered. Nothing ever came of it. The, uh, two of the, two of the hard drives and half of the flash drives belong to my employer. They had a guy there, their expert in data recovery was a fellow who had a top secret clearance that had worked for the government for years. And specifically he was a Navy guy and he had tried to recover the stuff. He came to my office and he said, what in the crap kind of stuff that you have on there? <laughs> and, un <laughs> and unfortunately I, I would play around after hours on my computer at work, looking at things and, you know, writing reports and, and, uh, you know, putting presentations together and stuff. And, and so I told him and he says, well, let me tell you, I've seen this kind of destruction before. And somebody was actually in your office with a handheld EMP device. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, and see, he had already gone around. He checked my boss's computer in their office next door. He had checked the computers on the floor below me and the computers on the floor above me, and none of them were, were damaged. My computers were, were catastrophically trashed, yeah. and he said there was only one thing he knew of that could do that. And uh, uh, my stuff at my home, he said, was uh, I brought some of my stuff from home, and he said that stuff was probably done by out of a helicopter. What? Really? believe it. Yeah. Yeah. But that happened to me. Much. That's not just me. I mean, I can, that's happened to a lot of folks, a lot of serious researchers that I know of. Um, so yeah. why do you think the government is trying to lock down the information to go to those extremes? Well, could, could be that there's a lot more to Bigfoot than what we realize. I know our government is involved. They can't do it in this country, but in a European country, they're involved in a lot of biomedical research or biological engineering research that, that was gleaned from the Soviets when the Soviet Union fell. I know that that's a fact. That's an indisputable fact. 
Yeah. And uh, uh, I know that's going on. I don't know how much of that is bled, bled over into the into the world of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Dogman, that type of thing. I have no idea if or or what. I know that could be one reason. I know that our our economy is much more fragile than we realize. Yeah. If you if you remember how the the stupid the little spotted owl how it wrecked the lumber industry in the uh, Pacific Northwest and through our nation and through our whole economy into a one of the worst recessions in the nation's history back in the 70s and in the early 80s um if if they came out and admitted that bigfoot existed and and all that imagine what if the tree huggers shut down the lumber industry which the lumber industry directly affects the housing industry and the housing industry is one of the main main things they track to keep to judge the health of our economy and 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 actually does have a direct effect on our economy if a spotted owl and in this side of the country the snail darter shut down you know basically sent us into a horrendous recession imagine what would happen if they admitted that bigfoot existed and what all the tree huggers and everything oh you can't log off anymore you're damaging the bigfoot habitat oh you know you you you're running this machinery you're you're scaring the bigfoot you know you're you know it would it would totally trash our economy plus you'd have every bubba in the countryside i'm gonna go kill me a bigfoot uh, yeah let's go come on boys there's a whole lot beer while i shoot that one right there you know and, uh, <laughs> you'd have most of the redneck population in the United States would get wiped out by Bigfoot, you know, because they were rednecks <laughs> or shooting them. And then nothing yep. would ever get done around here because rednecks are the only ones nowadays that still do something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty Trump got into a new level. <laughs> <Right. laughs> and uh, I mean, I'm a redneck and I'm proud of it. <laughs> but I know better than to go shoot a Bigfoot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't, want, I don't want to make enemies of my neighbors. <laughs> oh, exactly. Especially those neighbors. <laughs> yeah, and that's what my grandmother used to call them. She called them the neighbors. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm I'm trying to I, I, I changed phones, Kumbo, and I don't have uh I don't have that dog man picture on this phone right now. I'm either gonna have to get Tully to send it back to me or something, so I'll send you the dog man picture. Do you have it? Positive. Do you have it, Cecil? I don't have it totally. Totally's totally listening, so maybe no, he okay. can send it. Yeah, if you'll send it to me. I'll send it on to you. But I, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to get it off a different phone. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, but, yeah, I, got, I know we're getting we're getting pretty late. I, I don't want to run y'all over too long. We're pushing three hours. Y'all got yeah. any other questions? Yeah. Well, you want in Cypress Cypress Swamp? You got any stories out of the Cypress Swamp down there off the Trace? There, in Mississippi. Uh, is that a is that a park on the trace? I'm not familiar it's, with it. Yeah, it's north of Jackson on the way back to Tupelo. Um, it's I've obviously driven past it. Way, you, I'm surprised you didn't stop and walk around it. It's got a little path. Hmm. Um, just that just circles around. It's got a lot of those little signs hmm. that talk about the the swamp, the cypress tree. Well, the uh, the ones I've stopped. I mean, I probably. And stopped it, but maybe a quarter of them, a quarter of the parks up and down the trace over the years. And generally, if if I haven't heard sighting reports around them, I I, I haven't stopped, you know. Uh, and I don't recall any reports around the Cypress Swamp. Now I do know this that uh, down in the Daniel Boone National Daniel Boone down in the DeSoto National Forest in South Mississippi. Uh, I uh, there's a cypress swamp down there that we've we've camped in a couple of times, and they are absolutely positively a bunch of boogers in there. Uh, absolutely positively. Uh, well, you guys recently, are. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say recently, um, as last weekend, I ran into a lady, and we were talking about um, you actually coming on the show and. 
-hmm. she said well i've got a big foot on my property and i said really and she's like yeah my my son saw it when he was three years old and he won't he won't go back out in the woods ever since he's 15 now Wow. And she said, well, I asked him, well, surely you'll hear it coming if it's that big. And he said, mama, it didn't make a noise. Yeah, that, that's but, the weird thing. Uh, <laughs> but she told me that there's been a number of sightings recently and was asking me about them. And I said, I don't know. I don't really research Bigfoot. Um, I just have an interest in it. And I was curious about that because she, she mentioned probably 12 different sightings in the last couple of months. That's wild. Huh. And she's located up um, north of Starkville. Oh, wow. Huh. Near West Point? I don't know. I just know north of Starkville. Okay. I've, I've researched around the West Point area. And my boy went to Mississippi State, so I'm pretty familiar with Starkville. Um, oh, I'm pretty familiar with awesome. that area. I always send yeah. everybody Mississippi State stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well... I used to be part of a group of engineers on the out on the arsenal in, you know, with NASA and with the Missile Command. They used to call us the Auburn Mafia, but <laughs> we we would uh we would let Mississippi State grads in in our group, you know, no problem. We we took them right in. Also, Tennessee Tech, we would take those guys right in, uh, and our our MTSU Middle Tennessee State University, we'd take those guys right in. Now. We had a guy that was uh, from, he was an electrical engineer from Georgia Tech, and he had to earn his way in. We, and he was on <laughs> probation for a long time. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, Mississippi State's good, or, or, you know, a good engineer. My, like I said, my boy, is a, he, he's got a civil degree. And in fact, he's a registered professional civil engineer, and he, he graduated from Mississippi State. And, uh, so they they got a good engineering school down there, and and I've known some I've known some Mississippi State vet, vets that were real good, and I've got a I've got a uh, niece that's got a uh, what kind of degree. She's got some kind of a she's got a degree from Mississippi State, and my daughter in law's got a degree from Mississippi State. So you know we were we were. In a, Exclusive, exclusively Auburn family for generations. <laughs> yeah. Mississippi State's a good school for sure. Yeah, we've started ex expanding out into Mississippi State. Yeah. Well, kids, school. that's gonna. It, we're we're at almost eleven o'clock, so kids, I'm not men. Yeah. <laughs> uh, say so, Mr. Say Mr. So. Baker, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, I'm afraid if we if we keep Cecil up much longer, he'll turn into a pumpkin. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be up until about ten tomorrow anyway, so don't matter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, so Cecil, where are you located? Um, I'm actually in London, Kentucky. Oh, that's what you told me. You told me. Never yeah. mind. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah, and I know where London is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm familiar with that area. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we'll have to. I'll have to come up there sometime, and we'll. We'll uh we'll go out to some of those places that I used to hang around cool. in down in there. I love it. But, uh, <laughs> but I worked all over. I worked from uh out. I don't know if you know that area on beyond um like Pineville and uh, Middlesbrough and all that. I worked out. Yeah. I worked all out east of there and around the coal mines and things. You know, working maintenance and stuff. And then we worked uh we worked out uh you know out from Pineville and. And then out northwest of Pineville and worked all the way around London and, like I said, E-Town, Corbin, yeah. and all that. On, I worked on a heavy maintenance and construction crew. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that was prevalent around here. You probably knew people from my hometown. I'm actually – I'm originally from Florida, but I moved to Clay County, Kentucky. Um, okay. When I was a young and then, then with my wife refused to live in Clay County because of the reputation, so I had to move over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I worked down there in, in uh, Bloody Bell County and Hazard County, yeah. uh, Kentucky, and, and and I can't remember can't remember the name of the county where where Middlesboro and and uh, Pineville are, but. Uh, yeah, I worked all over that place back in the back in the mid seventies. Yeah, 
It's some crazy place. I go down that. I go down those yeah. places all the time. Going to Cumberland, Fall, yeah, not Cumberland Gap and things like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I was uh, I was actually living. You know where Tazewell is, New Tazewell, and all that. Yeah, yeah. South. Yeah, I actually lived. Yeah, I lived uh, there in Tazewell there for a while, and and uh, this is before they had the tunnel through Cumberland Gap. You used to have to go up and over, and you went right through the the tip of Virginia and then came down the mountain and, and you yeah. came down right by the very first Kentucky fried chicken place. There. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. I ate there not yeah. too long ago. <laughs> yeah. It's about 15 yeah. minutes. <laughs> yeah. It was all time. You could sit down at that Kentucky fried chicken place and watch all the trucks coming down the mountain with their brakes on fire. Yeah. You know, that, coming through that gap was something else. <laughs> Now, now there's a tunnel through there. I haven't driven through the tunnel yet, but but I, whenever I'd be coming home, I'd I'd go through there and I'd stop in that tip of Virginia and I'd load my truck up full of cigarettes cheap. I'd bring them back down to Alabama and sell them and make a pile of money. <laughs> That's illegal as I'll get out. But, uh, I just hope the, hope the statute of limitations is over with. But, hey, I'm happy. Hey, I had I had about 17, 18 different jobs to put myself through college. I mean, uh, and you know, I, I'm amazed. You know, there's four of us. I got two brothers and a sister, and every one of us, all four of us, managed to get through college on our own. You know, our parents didn't didn't pay. Uh, I, I don't know how I don't know how and where we all did it, but but we did. Uh, there's a, after we get off here, I want to show you something too because there's actually a place in Clay County that's kind of interesting. I want to show you a little artifact. All right. <laughs> All right. I'll show you a little artifact. See it right there? Yeah, that's cool. That's that's the best looking rock that the boogers have thrown in my yard this year so far. It and, looks like uh, a potato. It does, doesn't it? It's uh it does. it's it's really cool. It's uh it's got little uh I don't even know I don't know where they got these. I got this thing. Most of the rocks they throw up here are they're real jagged, but this is I don't know if they got it went down to river and found it or what, but it's got a, it's got these little uh, layers and stuff in it. Nice. It's uh, it's pretty neat. Yeah, I was sitting out on the front porch. And, I mean, anytime you, any any pretty night, you know, this the weather's right. You can sit out on the porch and just sit there and let the dogs get all calmed down and everything, or, or put the dogs in the house and and uh and you be sitting there, you'll hear you know. Boom, 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 you know, there'll be a rock hit hit right out there in the yard. And, what do you uh, think that means? That's just the GV's messing with you. That hey, we're here. You know, yeah. in fact, when when this one when this one landed out in the yard, and uh, I've I got lights all around here. I mean, this place is lit up like JFK Airport. You know, but uh, <laughs> and, and my this I'm, st I'm staying temporarily in my sister's old place while they're working while they're putting my place up. And uh, I know it's a river rock. <laughs> <laughs> Smart Alec. <laughs> yeah. That's, what, uh, is that? what is that one, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but uh, anyway, uh, uh, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> um, anyway, they, they, what they're doing is uh, the, the Jubies love to mess with us. I mean, we're their best entertainment. And uh, that's why they, they, you know, they, there's a number of places here on a farm. You can just go sit and it doesn't, you don't have to sit there very long and rocks will start coming in. And, you know, sometimes you'll hear them coming through the limbs, you know, clicking leaves and twigs <laughs> and stuff and they'll land out in front of you and, or behind you or something. And every once in a while they'll hit a tree and drop down, you know, fall right at there where you can see them, but uh, this is this is my sister and brother in law's place. And like I said earlier in the show, the, the hedgerow right behind the house here is a major thoroughfare, major travel route for them, and it has been for the, the, the old farmhouse has been here since 1885, so it, it could have been a travel route for hundreds of years. I don't know, but uh, uh I know that. <laughs> Some of the windows on the backside of the house were all covered up. My sister said she didn't. 
she didn't like them coming up here and looking in the windows. <laughs> now that's one of the things you talk about something scared me. The idea of of looking out a window and there's a booger right there looking back in, that scares me. That that scares me a lot. The yeah. very the very first sighting report I ever took, ever, that I wrote down was a I thought it was a booger. I wrote it down as a, as a booger. Turned out it was dog man. Found out, figured it out years later, and I came back and re -interview, re interviewed people. The lady was washing dishes. It was the full moon in, in October of that year, and it was a clear night. And the kitchen window faces east, and she was washing dishes, and she was watching the moon come up, and she was washing dishes. Um, <laughs> And, and, and she was still you know, enjoying looking at the moon and she looked back up and the moon was gone. And she thought, well, where'd it go? You know, I wonder if some clouds come in. She leaned up to the window to look out. And as she leaned up, this big face leaned in. Oh, that's terrifying. <laughs> and she saw it and she goes, she starts going, oh, 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 like this. And stumbling backwards across the kitchen. Her youngest son was sitting at the kitchen table doing his homework. He jumped up. So, he yelled and he jumped up so fast that he turned the kitchen table over. <laughs> so the mother's going, ah, ah, and all of a sudden he hears the, he hears the, his little brother yell or scream. And then boom, the table turns over. So the oldest son, by the way, the father's at work. He worked second shift. The oldest son is in the in the den watching TV. He hears all this commotion. He jumps up and comes running in there. And he said, what he saw is the thing is looking in the window and he's <laughs> looking around in the kitchen. And now they had had so much activity around their house that they had wired in. They had these double-headed spotlight, uh, floodlight fixtures all around the house under the eave on every corner and inside of every corner and on the long parts that have you know one on the corner and maybe one in the middle but they had it all fixed up and they wired it all up to a common switch they had a, if anybody knows what i'm talking about they had a relay lighting system a low voltage relay lighting system so they had four switches around the house and in, in strategic places in the house you could hit one of those, any one of those four switches and every one of the lights would come on. It just so happens there was one of those in the hallway right outside the kitchen door. And so he just reached up there and flipped the switch and boom, all the lights came on. And he said immediately he sees the thing like that and it takes off running across their front yard. He runs out the, on, he runs out the front door and he sees the thing as it's running out across his yard. And then it hit, took off running down the street towards the river. And uh, when I was taking that, that report from his mom and his little brother and him, my skin was crawling the whole time. <laughs> and, uh, in fact, it's crawling right now. And, but they back in the back in about a this would have been in about 1975. Um, I was, uh, we'd had, we'd had some calves disappearing off the back of the farm and we were convinced that uh, and they were disappearing without a trace. We knew that coyotes were killing them because we weren't finding any, any, any sign of anything. You know, coyotes will eat what they can and leave the rest. You know, you'll find the coyote, the bone. Stuff. So we thought they were being rustled. So, Several nights a week, after dark, I would walk to the back of the farm, and uh, me and my I had a big Doberman pincher, and I had a place I could sit back there, sort of backed up in some bush, brush, and I could see to the south and the southeast. I could see an area of about 160 acres of our pasture, and then to the northeast, I could see about another. 60 or 70 acres and it was back in that area where the cattle were disappearing and so but there was a, the only way they could get in there without us not, without us 
you know, coming through the main part of the farm. Where I was sitting was where an old road bed came in across the neighbor's property and it dead ended against our fence. But there was a gate there that you could that you could still open it and um and, and get onto our farm. So that's where I was sitting and waiting. And I had a Lee Enfield 303 British Army rifle, bolt action army rifle, held 11 rounds, 10 in the magazine, one in the chamber. And I had my Doberman pincher. And so we were just hanging out there waiting for somebody to show up to rustle our cattle. And again, just like what had happened in, during weeks before, nothing nothing showed up. I had to go to work the next day. This was on a Thursday night. And um, I started walking home. There was a, a about a, almost a quarter moon up. So it was pretty bright. I didn't even have a flashlight with me. And uh, so I'm walking home. And from there to, to the house, to my grandmother's house, which is about 200 yards from here, was about three quarters of a mile. And um, so um, a little bit more than that, closer to a mile. So um, I'm walking along and um, got to a place where I'm skirting along a wood line up on a ridge. We call it the bee ridge because we used to have a bunch of beehives up there. So I'm walking along and I start getting this creepy feeling that I'm being watched. <laughs> and uh, about that time, I hear I hear a noise and it's my Doberman pincher and he's whining. And he's and I looked over and he's got his he's all bowed up and he's got his little old tail stuck down tight against his rear end. And he's and he's looks like he's been kicked, you know, like somebody's kicked him or, or done something. And he keeps looking back over his left shoulder. And uh and I keep getting kept getting more and more creepy and I, I felt like I, we were in getting in more and more danger. And I had my rifle slung on my shoulder. And so I, I take my rifle off my shoulder and I click the safety off. The instant I click my safety off, right over my shoulder, about about 75, 80 feet behind me, over my shoulder. This thing cut loose and it screamed so loud, it shook me all the way through to my core. And I had never heard a scream that loud from that close. I'd heard screams like that, but never that close. And I couldn't help it. They, you know, you're not supposed to run from something like that. I couldn't help it. My feet had another idea. I busted out running right out towards the middle of that pasture. And I'd run about 50 yards. Now, this is the funny part. I run about 50 yards, and I suddenly realize, oh, my God, I'm running from a, from this from this monster. And I knew it was a Bigfoot. And uh, anyway, it, it, you know, it finally registered on me. That was a Bigfoot screaming at me. And I slammed on the brakes, and I spun around with my rifle up. And right about that time, my dog goes right past me. I was running so fast. I was staying ahead of that Doberman pitcher. <laughs> that ain't supposed to be possible, but I, I'm telling you, it happened. <laughs> I mean, I had enough time to stop and spin around with my rifle up. I ain't back to those woods, and here comes a dog. Boom, right past me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, so I, I was scared to turn my back on again, so I backed across, back to the south across that field, you know, for about 50 yards. And uh, and then I turned around, I jogged a little bit, and I spun around again, and finally I made it back up here to the house. And when I got to the house, I pulled my keys out of my pocket, and I was shaking so bad I couldn't get the – I was like Barney Fife, you know. <laughs> I was shaking so bad I couldn't get the key in the door, and I had to hold the key with both hands, and I was still shaking like a dog pooping peach, pit, peach pits. And I, and I finally got the door unlocked, and the dog is standing, and he's bouncing at the door, wanting in, wanting in, wanting in. And I got that door, and boom, he took off inside ahead of me. So that's Thursday night. And uh, – <laughs> All right, so Friday night, 
I go out on a date. Got me a hot date, you know, single back then, you know, I'm in college. And uh, so I come in about 1, 1.30 and uh, get cleaned up, go to the bathroom, get cleaned up, and undressed, you know, and, and uh, brush my teeth and all that. And, uh, and I walk out of the bathroom and, uh, and I look to the to the right, there's a little short sort of a hallway there. You actually come out into another room, which then there's a door to the left that goes into the bedroom. And I walked out of the bathroom. I look, and my dog, my big, big dog room pincher, he's standing there, and all his hackles are up, and he's stiff-legged, and he's got his ears pinned back, and he's growling at the front window of my bedroom, the south window. Mm. And about that, and the moon is up now. And about that time, I see a, a big shadow go across that window. And the dog starts turning to the west, and he's turning like this. And then, and there's a big, a big double window on the west wall of the bedroom. And I see that big shadow come across that. And he keeps turning. Well, there's a there's a another window in the west wall of the room I'm standing in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the shadow moves across that, and uh, and now we've got a we've got a booger light or a yard light out there that shines through the backyard there on the north side, and there's a big window right there. I could have gone and looked out. There's also a window in the bathroom <laughs> that's about this big, <laughs> and I could not make myself go look out that window. All I could think about was, what if I looked out that window and that dude is sitting there looking back at me? <laughs> so, so I real quiet, I stepped over into the bathroom and it's got those little old blinds in it. And I raised up that blind. I looked out. <laughs> Nothing. I don't know where it went, but. Uh, On the roof. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Shut up, <man. laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it, and uh, but I remember I was absolutely I was too scared to look out that window, and oh, but, yeah. so here you know three years later, three or four years later, I'm taking the that report from those people there. She's talking about that window, that booger, <laughs> the dog man looking at the window at her, and that still absolutely gives me the creeps. Yeah, yeah, that, that's why we put put curtains up in our kitchen. Kumbo is yeah, she, she was yeah. afraid going to look after look out the carport what? door one day and one going to be looking in it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you what, this happened to me in Mississippi and they've done it uh, here and they've done it multiple times when I wasn't here. Apparently when my sister and brother-in-law were living here. But uh, one time I, I had a run with you, you probably heard the story of when uh, we were playing a bunch of, bunch of calls on a stereo system and, and, uh, uh, anyway, I ac accidentally called up the alpha from the local local uh, troop, and he was not happy. And uh, he was out there in the yard yelling and screaming. And long story short, I ended up. Uh, I'm gonna cut out a lot of the real creepy stuff, but uh, that's a that's a long story. But anyway, I ended up in the bedroom that night with my big old six six high, great old big old oak chest door shoved over in front of my bedroom door and I laid down on the bed dressed, still fully dressed with my riot gun my 12 gauge riot gun loaded up with slugs and buckshot laying right here beside me and the now this is in a rental house so the bed didn't have a headboard so I had to keep the head of the bed shoved right up against the wall to keep my pillow from falling off behind me during the night well, I fell asleep, and all of a sudden, that dead gum booger, <laughs> boom! He hauled off and hit the side of the trailer. This is in a mobile home. He hit the side of the trailer so hard that he left knuckle marks in the siding. Wow. And then, and one of my dogs was so scared she was under the bed. She comes running out from under the bed, dives in the closet where Obo was already hiding, and. Uh, <laughs> I jump up and I'm jumping up and I got the shotgun up like this. And uh and all of a sudden I hear this noise. I hear this the son of a gun went down the full length of that trailer, dragging his fingernails on the side. 
That gives me the creeps. Yeah. Now, if you were here right now, I could take you out in the backyard and look at the back of this, and there's a big old knuckle, a couple of knuckle marks in the side. No, there's a trailer <laughs> and big drag marks, drag marks down the side. And that's happened to me once since I've lived here. It obviously happened to my sister and my brother-in-law when they lived here. Oh, there's, yeah. it's, it's, there's more than one set of drag marks down the side of the trailer. And uh, <laughs> i tell you what, they're the masters of intimidation. Oh, yeah. and, and if and if you wondered, if you come in here, you look and you say, what in the world I got all these lights here for? I mean, uh, no kidding. There's, let me see, one, two, three, four, five, uh, six. There's six big sets of floodlights plus a, a street light right out here in the, no, there's not a street light out there. Right out here in the backyard, lighting up the backyard. Six wow. big double floodlights. <laughs> All right. Then in the front yard, we got a booger light. And anyway, I got four, five, or six sets of lights. Seven, six sets of lights on the front porch. I got another set down here on the end of the, end of the trailer down there. I mean, this place... I mean, I, they can see this from the space shuttle. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, yeah, that's what my sister and brother in law put in. <laughs> and, and, uh, that's, that's one thing about out here. Anybody that spent any time out here is, has, uh, has learned about Bigfoot. So let me ask you because, you know, I've listened to a lot of shows and there's some researchers that have been doing it for years and they've never seen one. So what do you think makes you different? Well, I grew up with them, but I honestly think that, uh, and it doesn't really matter that I grew up with them. Uh, I think part of it has to do with I've spent so much time in the woods, I'm more attuned to them. But I think somehow they know they can read our, now this sounds like woo stuff, and uh, but it is a fact. It is a proven fact. You can prove it through Karelian photography that people have auras. You can measure them. You can photograph them with the with the right equipment. We all have an aura. We all give off a field. Other animals and even people can detect those, and and they can they can figure out our intent. They can figure out. They can figure out like our basic personality. You all have known of people that dogs just hate them. Yeah. Doesn't matter which dog. All dogs do, or cats, or whatever. They can. Then I've learned that if my dog doesn't like somebody or, or doesn't <laughs> trust somebody, then I better watch out. Yeah. And uh, that's been proven. That's been proven time and again. Uh, uh, but this is woo, that, and I'm just gonna go there. So, but, I, I, but I'm what else? What else? Okay. But, um, well, one, well, of the thing, one of the things that I've learned is like when you're dealing with people who have a higher vibration, and I know that sounds crazy, but like it's like you're more open minded to it. I think that people who are more. Mm -hmm open-minded to the fact that it's out there and they've seen it i mm -hmm. think that it it makes their vibration higher and i think that's kind of what you're saying with the auras is that they they sense that difference or are in tune with yeah. it it could be a um this starts sounding even crazier but i think that some people have a better access to the part of their brain that um, is telepathic, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. that intuition. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, and some people just don't. They have that block. It's just they, they just don't access that. Um, well, let me tell you, it, they even talk about it in the Bible. They clearly tell you in the Bible. In fact, you know, I think I can't remember if one of the apostles, if it was Jesus said that, that, to listen for that still small voice, 
Mm-hmm. And that's how, that's how your sixth sense works. And I think a lot of that comes from the Holy Spirit. And yeah. um, that I also think that, well, like I said, they can, they can detect our intent. They can detect, uh, in fact, I tell people that are, when they're going hunting, I call it the Zen of hunting. And now this is, and I don't know about something this, this devil related or anything. It's an attitude. And that when you go hunting, if you want to be successful, you have got to suppress that predatory aura. You've got to pull in that predatory attitude and instinct and, um, and, uh, and energy field. You've got to sort of, you've got to withdraw and sort of pull everything back into yourself. And it works. It makes a huge difference. And with me, it makes a huge difference in, in my success as a hunter. Mm-hmm. And if I go out there with a predatory attitude that, that, you know, I'm fixing to kill something, you know, I'm find me a deer and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill it. You know, I have seen deer that were minding their own business because it's not a care in the world. And I've eased up on them or either I, or either they're, they've grazed out into the field. And they have no idea that I'm anywhere close, but I've, I can be looking at them from two or 300 yards away without consciously sucking that aura in and sucking in that energy. And, and I'm looking to them in a predatory manner and they will detect it from that distance away and get nervous. And a lot of times even look right at me and, uh, and then they'll, they'll run away or, or ease off. I have had, I know one of the, one of the first times that I ever had one just was walking along and like he, I, and without a care anywhere, I'm talking about a booger now. I was deer hunting. I was, it was, it was a uh, muzzleloader season over in, uh, um, what, uh, Wheeler National Wildlife Refuge on the other side of Decatur, Decatur, Alabama. And I'm, a, I'm down in a, uh, near a creek called Take a Creek. And I'd hiked back in there on a road that's, that's always gated off. It's uh, only the, the park personnel have access, but it's in the legal hunting area. And I'd walked off down there and I'd found me a really nice knoll that, uh, that went down towards the creek and you could, you could see a lot of area and a lot of really good, it was good deer sign down in there. And I'd found me a stump just back before we had, you know, easily portable uh, climbing stands and stuff like that. I'd found me a really good stump that I could sit down and lean back against. And I'm sitting down there and been down there since before daylight. Uh, I was just uh, taking it easy, and uh, it's about seven o'clock in the morning. The sun had come up over the ridge behind me. The, my back was—I was looking west, my back to the east. Sun hadn't come on up, come over the ridge behind me yet, and I hear somebody walking down through the woods, crunching the leaves. I thought, "Dead gum it!" I said, "They should have seen my trunk out there at the gate and known that there was somebody down in here." They ought to be a little bit more careful, try to be a little, you know, be courteous and be a little bit quieter coming through here. And I, I thought at first that they were moving further towards the river, but then I realized they were walking down the knoll that I'd come down. And so I, I'm sitting there and I cut my head over and all of a sudden I was on the, just to the, I was just to the south of the crest of the knoll just north of the crest of the knoll, here comes a grown male booger walking down through there. <laughs> and he just walking along, you know, and uh, swinging his arms and everything and and uh, stomping the leaves and going, not, not perfectly stomping, you know, <laughs> you know here he, he goes past me and he gets about about 40, 50 yards past me, and all of a sudden he just stopped. And he's standing there, just, just standing there like this. I'm thinking, well, what does he say? And I'm I'm looking, I'm thinking he's looking at something across the creek. And all of a sudden he goes, like that. 
and he spun around instantly, locked eyes with me instantly. <laughs> you've heard about you've heard about brown shorts moment. <laughs> <laughs> That that was one of the times that I've been absolutely terrified because he he had a look on his face that he was pissed off that I had surprised him or I had gotten one over on him or something. Now it had warmed up enough the thermals were coming from the creek up. So there's no way he smelled me. Absolutely no way. Somehow, I didn't have a predatory attitude, but I wasn't didn't have everything stuffed in either. Somehow he felt my presence. His sixth sense of kicking, he felt, but I was looking at him. He felt me looking at him. Yeah. That's, and, uh, that's, that's the thing Greg talks about. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but that was that was one of those utterly terrifying moments because I didn't know what was going to happen next. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't. I, and he just stared at me for a, he just we were we were eyeball to eyeball for I don't know 15, 20 years something like that. Uh, probably no kidding, ten to fifteen seconds. And suddenly I realized. So uh, either my grandmother or my great grandmother or something said had said I'd heard one of them say, "Don't look them in the eyes." Yeah, and I was I was staring at him and I it, this it hit me I, I heard it in my head you know don't look them in the eyes and I I sort of did like that and I heard it move and I looked up again and it had turned around and, and rather than going the direction it was going it had turned ninety degrees. And it was walking straight north away from me and almost straight north. And, That's wild. But, and I don't know where it went. It just finally went out of sight. I couldn't hear it anymore. Now, for all I know, it could have circled around behind me and, and, uh, and, and then sneaked back up there and been standing there with his fist double back ready to punch me <laughs> or, or, or toted a four foot diameter tree trunk up there ready to squish me with it. I, I don't know. Yeah. But I, what I do know is I sat there a while longer and I, I never could get easy again. And, and, I, and I got up and left and, I, and went up to another place and killed a nice eight point buck. <laughs> but, uh, well, but, Mr. Baker, I hope you will come back and have some more conversations with us because this has been a lot of fun for me. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. All right. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Oh, we appreciate yeah. that. I hope uh I hope that uh 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 yeah Jimmy Osborne's telling about something happened to him down there on Kataka Creek. But, uh, yeah, there's a lot of sighting. I didn't know it at the time, but it turns out this was in pre internet days when this happened. But since the internet's been out there, there's a lot of sighting reports from the Kataka Creek area. That Kataka Creek watershed is a is a booger hot spot. Nice. Oh, we're going, but, this has been really awesome. We appreciate you a lot coming on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And um, I'm serious about coming back anytime you want to. I mean, yeah, we have we, weird conversations all the time, and we yeah. always love to have somebody with a different perspective join us. It, it was just, just two weeks ago we were talking about the auras that you were talking about how they can mm -hmm. actually. Them. Oh yeah, we yeah. It's uh, last night. Hey, I I'll tell you something that, that I saw that was utterly crazy. There was a, there was a a, a couple of photographers that worked with us and used to document a lot of our test setups and things. And one of the one of those guys had actually done Karelian uh, photography. He had the stuff to do it with and stuff, which I don't know if they if they're still allowed. I, it just just about middle of the eighties or, or something, early eighties, just boom, all of a sudden you quit, quit hearing about it. I haven't heard any of anybody doing it. But I do know that, that we had a guy that worked there that was missing his right arm from about here down. His right hand. About middle of his, his forearm down. And uh that photographer took a picture of his arm 
and you could still see his hand and everything. Yeah. Wow. And he could now get this. He could think about moving his hands and the fingers in the aura would move. Wow. Turns out that's how they that's how they they got these little sensors that they when they these high, super high tech artificial limbs now that yeah. they can put on people. They've got little sensors that can uh they can pick up when you're thinking about moving that missing limb or moving a missing finger or something, and it'll make the, the prosthetic move. <laughs> but cool. yeah. Yeah. And uh yeah, it's uh there's you know, used to uh, back in the day, National Geographic had several different sections or stories about the Karelian photography and how you could uh you could even do something like take a picture of a leaf and then tear it, tear off part of the leaf and take another picture of it in Karelian photography and the part of the leaf that was gone would still show up. That's wild. But yeah. figure that. I need to get my pants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I need to let y'all go. I need to shut up and let y'all go. Okay. Yeah. This has been awesome. Though. I, I, I really yeah. appreciate it. I know all of us appreciate you coming on. We've had people yeah. watch very much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to well, get him and Tracy together. Yeah. <laughs> Tracy is my friend that she's... um. A, a Lakota medicine woman. Yeah. Oh, cool! I've I'm a used to have a friendship. Well, we we sort of got separated, but I used to have a friendship with the uh, with the lady who is the medicine woman for the uh, Wichita and Delaware tribes. Cool. She's also the designated baboo lady. And baboo is their word for Bigfoot. Oh, cool! Yeah. I also know one of the ladies, the Bigfoot ladies, that's uh, connected with the Navajo tribe. Oh. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, we definitely need to have you back on so we can go down that those rabbit holes, too. That'd be definitely. Fun. Yeah, because yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there, there's, there, there's a lot more to say about... Uh, Oh, we haven't even we haven't even hit the tip of the iceberg of what no. all I want to ask. So. Um. Oh, hey, uh, since my buddy Jimmy's on there, you see this? Yes. yes. Our friend Greg Greg brought this to me this afternoon. Really oh, nice. Yeah, Greg House brought that to me. Yeah, thank cool. you, Greg. Thank you, Abby. And I gave his daughter Abby a, a one of my booger rocks that's been thrown out in the yard. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. I've got one on the one ton out there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, I hate to do it because I like a party too, but I've got to go to get some sleep. <laughs> but it has been right. a pleasure, and yeah, I just I can't say enough about how tickled I am that you came on the show, Kumbo. It's been fascinating. Yeah. Come back anytime. Absolutely. And Stephen Hill, yeah. thank you for reaching out to Kumbo and getting him. Yeah, yeah I, I appreciate Greg uh, for. Trusting me enough to let me be able to get in touch with Kimbo. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the community. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I I know I'm gonna say I, I know where I, I know where I got the dog man picture at now. I just had to remember who I'd sent it to most recently. <laughs> so it was <laughs> all right. Spencer. I want to hear everything he says about it, but I seriously have to go and I I will um keep you all in my thoughts and prayers and I'll talk to y'all soon. And y'all know what you got to do, Cecil? What? You got to stay weird, kid. Stay weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>